Same as system microphone. Let me just quickly check. Ah, okay. Can you hear? Can you hear us? Yeah, maybe we can quickly check. Okay, can you hear tests? Can you hear? Oh, okay. Looks like uh, people are able to hear us. Very good. So let's get uh, started. Wait, so. Okay, it's working. Very good. So, uh, I'll just have to. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. I'm oh, sorry, I need sorry, a pocket. Everybody. I haven't got a pocket. I mean, anyway, it's fine. So, we can put it So, it's, it's working right now. Uh, Lucy, you have uh, 10 minutes to talk to the audience. I'm going to find it a bit tricky to fill 10 minutes, but I've got, so I've got some notes anyway. All right, guys, so let's get started. So can you have attention, please? Sure. The president of Elsra is going to <laughs> make an announcement. Welcome to the Elsra annual podium. Well, hello, everybody. I don't know if I'm president, but I am chair. <laughs> I am chair. So, first of all, a brief introduction. Uh, in case you don't know uh, the history um, of Elslof. Um, it's more than 10 years. I, I can't remember exactly when we started it. Um, anyone who wants to call out how many years ago we started it, but it's more than 10. Um, it was a group of us um, academics in the London area uh, who got together to form a group, which after some discussion, we decided to give the name the London Second Language Acquisition Research Forum, which is not elegant, but it is exact. And we call ourselves LSLAF for short, which is not elegant either, but it's short. Um, we got together because we otherwise really only met each other at international conferences. Um, and we thought it would be really good if we had something more local and cheaper and easier to get to uh, where we could, uh, we could gather, we could share uh, research updates, we could seek advice from each other about research proposals, we could talk about pressing research issues within SLA, we could even practice with each other presentations that we were preparing for uh, conferences that we were going to. And um, it was very successful. Uh, we all liked each other, opened our doors to more and more members. And uh, after, after a while, we decided that we would establish an annual colloquium. And this is what we're doing today, a colloquium at which we, as the academic in, uh, in Elslaf would present to uh, an audience in London uh, parts of our research or papers that we had recently given or recently published, for example. We established at the same time the idea that we would hold a, an annual PhD student conference so that our PhD students would have a very distinguished and friendly audience at which to present updates on their research. And we've been doing these two uh, conferences uh, every year for quite some time now. Uh, 
COVID made us go online. So we didn't stop because we were all isolating at home. We went online and we did the PhD conference on Zoom and we did the annual colloquium on Zoom as well. And so we're delighted uh, today to be back in person. Today we're at Birkbeck and we have an audience in the room of ELSLAF members and assorted uh, PhD students. And for the first time, uh, we've also got a live online audience uh, across the world. I have no idea how big that audience is, but um, the reach, because it's going to be recorded also for the first time, the reach is potentially global and that the things that we discuss today uh, can be accessed and viewed again. So all of us are on our best behavior. Uh, we have a really full program of talks, um, which I think you've probably, well, you've seen, haven't you, in the, uh, in the room, you have seen it. And if you are online abroad and you haven't seen it, well, you know, it's going to be great. It's going to be exciting <laughs> uh, because it's extremely varied. The talks are going to be, uh, a, it's a 20 minute deal that we all get as speakers, um, during which time the audience is invited to scribble down questions. That's for you online as well as for you here. And then there'll be about 15 minutes afterwards for posing questions. And we are going to be, um, looking to include the online audience as well, assuming there is one. So if you are online and you want to pose a question, there's a way of doing that, which I assume is by writing it down. I don't actually know the, obviously not putting your hand up. Uh, but anyway, I'm sure that's been explained to you. Um, so we're starting shortly and we'll be going on with a lunch break, uh, a one hour lunch break, break and then we will reconvene after lunch and go on until five o'clock this evening London time when we'll all be completely exhausted but very much better informed about SLA and quite excited about it all and we can depart to our uh, various homes. Are there any questions from the audience here about any housekeeping issues that you need to know about? No, no, everybody is nodding and smiling, so that's great. So I would like to introduce, therefore, our first speaker, which is Andrea Revesh. Andrea is Professor of Second Language Acquisition at the Institute of Education, University College London. She's also the Associate Editor of Studies in Second Language Acquisition, and she's the vice president of the International Association of Task-Based Language Teaching. Um, Andrea is very widely published, um, impressively so, in areas such as uh, TBLT, um, interactional studies, um, SLA input, individual differences in both oral and uh, written L2 performance. And uh, she's very practiced at giving presentations. We're all looking forward very much to hearing her paper now. So I, with no more ado, I invite Andrea to take the stage. I will leave the stage and do the timings instead. Welcome, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, 
all around uh, on YouTube as well. Um, thank you very much for this generous introduction. And today I'll be talking about, um, as you can see, um, a big project, not a big project, but a project involving a lot of uh, colleagues. It's an interdisciplinary team. My co-researchers um, are Haiyan John Jung, uh, Shun Shui Matsaura, um, Motoaki Sugiura, and Haini Chui from Tohoku University in Japan, who are neurolinguists, uh, neuroscientists, and also, uh, Shungo Suzuki from Waseda University and Kazuya Saito, who is in the room, and probably all of you, all of you knew. So it's a team of uh, neuroscientists and, and behavior researchers. And maybe I should say the beginning, I'm a, more of a second language acquisition researcher, as you've heard. I don't have the neuroscience background that some of my colleagues uh, have. So let me start with a brief background to this study. I'll be talking about the neurocorrelates of mid and end close pauses in air to speech. So what does speech production involve? Sorry. Just some technical issues. <laughs> this will always happen. I think I did. Okay. Apologies. No, no, no worries at all. So, yeah, let me start with the with an introduction again. So, uh, the study is conceptualizing speech production research. So, let me go through uh, some of the main stages in second language speech production. When we uh, speak in a second language, first we need to conceptualize our speech. We need to think about what we are planning to say. The next, oops, uh, yeah, here. And then what we do once we have a plan, what we would like to say, then we formulate these processes uh, through lexical, grammatical encoding, morphological encoding, and phonetic encoding processes. And once we have this linguistic form, we translate this uh, into a phonetic form through articulation processes. And the last stage when it comes to speech production is monitoring, which happens interactively. All of these um, stages happen interactively and monitoring happens at all stages. We constantly check what we would like to say is aligned with our intended message. But sometimes conceptualization and formulation processes are difficult, especially when it comes to second language speech, and these might result in disfluencies. When it comes to disfluencies in second language speech production, first language speech production, we can make a distinction among three types of um, fluency. Speed fluency, the rate of which has to do with the rate of delivery. Repair fluency, which has to do with repetitions and self-corrections in one speech. And breakdown fluency, which captures pausing behaviors. Among these various facets of fluency, breakdown fluency seems to be particularly important because research has shown that perceived fluency is more related to breakdown fluency than speed and repair fluency. Perceived fluency meaning how raters um, perceive how uh, fluent somebody's speech is. In a recent meta-analysis uh, by Suzuki et al, it has also been found that mid-close pauses are more strongly related to perceived fluency, fluency ratings. From first language acquisition research, um, we know, and at least it has been assumed, that pausing at different locations is going to be associated with different speech production processes. And close pauses are assumed to indicate engagement in conceptualization. Remember, this has to do with one wants to say. On the other hand, mid-close pauses might signal breakdowns in lexical and syntactic encoding processes. And there is also empirical evidence suggesting that this might be the case. L1 speakers, when you speak in your first language, you're more likely to pause uh, between than within clauses. So we're not disrupted with linguistic encoding processes, but we might get disrupted if we need to think about what we would like to say. It has also been found that mid-close pausing in first language speech typically occurs before open class words, if it does happen, when we try to say less frequent words, probably that we use uh, less uh, often than more frequency words. 
Compared to first language speech, what we find in second language speech that L2 speakers, not surprisingly, tend to pause more often mid-close than L1 speakers, and less proficient L2 users pause often more often mid-close. So there is also the proficiency element. Again, the less proficient we are, the more likely we, we might struggle with linguistic encoding processes, which might be um, reflected in mid-close pausing. This is what I've just said. Uh, in light of this, second language acquisition researchers assume that mid-close pauses might be linked to second language difficulties in constructing a syntactic frame by forming lexical links, basically linguistic encoding processes. But when it comes to end close pauses, we do find that L1 and L2 speakers don't differ as much. Again, when it comes to deciding what we want to say, it's not likely to differ across L1 and L2 speakers. And this is probably because end close posing again might relate to conceptualization processes. All of these insights so far have been derived from psycholinguistic studies, and there is no direct evidence about the neural processes underlying second language speech. So the aim of our study was to examine the neural processes of silent posing, how location of posing, whether second language speakers in our case, pause mid-close or end-close, may relate to differential neural processes during spontaneous speech production. So our specific research question was as follows. To what extent does the location of silent pauses, whether it happen mid-close or end-close, relate to neural processes during second language speech productions? And in light of the literature review, you won't be surprised that we assume that mid-close pauses would be linked to activation in language-related brain areas. On the other hand, end-close pauses would be linked to activation in conceptualization-related brain areas. Our participants were 26 Japanese learners of Air to English. We had to exclude two participants due to issues with uh, the recording. They were all university students. There were 12 female, 14 male students. The mean age was around 20. And they all did the Oxford listening test. And it seemed like that the majority were at the CFR B2 level. And we also had a few C1 participants. This meant that they were able to speak and produce speech um, during the task that we asked them to do. These are the eight tasks they completed. They were all monologic speaking performances. Um, they were asked to talk about disaster related topics at a conference. I, somebody asked me why disaster related topics, because this was the grand call we tried to, to go for. So this is the reason why we went for these. Um, for example, they had to uh, talk about um, or react in a situation when there was an earthquake, vaccination, flooding, and so on. Here's an example uh, for one of the tasks we asked them to engage in. Imagine you're a firefighter, you're caught a fire in a tall building, you arrive with a helicopter, but there are eight people on the roof and you can't take everybody. Those of you are language teacher, the typical desert island scenario, but now on the top of a building. And then we had people with different characteristics and people had to make a choice uh, which uh, five people they would take. They had one minute planning time, and then they had two minutes for the actual speech performance. Some of these, or half of these tasks were uh, conducted, were carried out in L2 English, and the other half in L1 Japanese. But now in this presentation, I'm only be uh, talking about the L2 speaking performances. Task type and language were counterbalanced across the participants and the sessions. They were doing all of this in an fMRI scanner, uh, and altogether, we had 30 minutes and 19 seconds of speech performances collected. Um, while participants were talking, we need to use a noise reduction microphone. I tried this myself. The fMRI machine is very loud, and actually, it was very difficult uh, to transcribe the speech performances. And I don't think we'll be able to do human ratings or any of, of that sort. You can see the difference there. If you look at the figure, what you would uh, hear when you have the noise, no noise reduction microphone, and then you have the reduction microphone. So, this was an important uh, element of the experiment. Uh, the scans were repeated uh, every two seconds, and in those two seconds, 53 slices of the brain were um, carried out, and that resulted in 14 and se uh, 17 volumes per uh, second. Then uh, what happened, once we had this data, we transcribed the uh, task performances. We had four tasks, remember, and we had 24 pa uh, participants, so it led to 98 uh, task performances. We did the transcriptions through Pratt. Again, this was a difficult procedure just because of the very uh, loud uh, recordings. 
And then we use Pratt software as well to analyze the speech performances. Um, this is the type of uh, output you would get there. And we had three tiers in our Pratt analysis. First, the task type, and then we also had the transcription. Here you can see the participant was saying, maybe you might not see, if I were in the sinking boat, I would choose knife and light, knife, lighter, uh, something along these lines. And then in the last year, we coded these speech performances. We coded for post type, whether participants made silent or field poses. There were relatively few field poses in our data set. So we went for, we only looked at silent poses in our analysis. And we also coded whether these uh, poses occurred mid close or end close. And our post threshold was 200, 250 milliseconds. This is the typical post threshold adopted in speech production studies. Here's an example for an end close silent pose bef uh, between if I were in the sinking boat pose, I will choose. This is between two closes. And here's an example for a mid close silent pose, I will choose mm, knife like knife lighter. Right. In terms of the fMRI analysis, we conducted a within participant analysis. Um, uh, we looked, we did a vocal by vocal multiprogression. I should say my colleagues at Tohoku University did this, so don't ask me detailed questions about the statistical analysis. And then we uh, did contrast images uh, between mid close and end close uh, performances. And then a one sample t test was used um, using statistical parametric mapping software. This is the typical software uh, which is used uh, in fMRI data analysis. Those of you who are familiar with fMRI research, you might be wondering how it was possible to do this because the sampling rate is only two seconds, right? So how can you look at post stress rolls at 250 milliseconds? Uh, we used a so-called jittered rapid presentation event-related design, which means that the interstimulus intervals were jittered. So in a way, when um, the onset of, of a pause started, we don't, it's not always at the same two-second interval. So in a way, uh, if you do this, and it's a random distribution when it comes to pauses, you can actually look at so, um, shorter time intervals as well. So it's possible to do this um, through fMRI uh, imaging. As I just mentioned, uh, this sort of jittering design that you would do artificially in an experiment, we didn't do it, need to do it artificially because when it comes to pauses, they happen in a random order, right? It's not every two seconds you would have a pause, but it could vary depending on the speech production process. So what did we find? Let me just remind you of the research question. To what extent does the location of silent pauses, whether they occur mid-cause or end-cause, relate to neural processes during speech production? Again, mid-cause pauses, we assume that would be related to language-related areas, and end-cause pauses would be linked to activation in conceptualization-related brain areas. Altogether in our data set, we identified 4,983 silent pauses. 70% of these, um, around 70% of these occurred mid-close and 30% end-close. And the mean was uh, 208, mid-close the mean was 146 and 62 um, per participant. So what did we find in the fMRI analysis? We found a significant effect for pause locations. And we did indeed find when it comes to mid-close pauses, they were associated with greater activation in areas which are sensitive to linguistic encoding, linguistic difficulty. These are the left imperial frontal gyrus, in particular the opercular and triangular areas. And these areas in previous uh, neuroscience research have been associated with syntactic processing and retrieval of words. And we also found that there were greater activation in the basal ganglia um, when it comes to mid-close poses. Again, this is an area that in previous research was associated with syntactic processing. So our first hypothesis seems to have been um, um, uh, confirmed. What about end-close poses? What we found that end close pauses um, were uh, associated with greater activation in so called uh, areas which are sensitive to theory of mind activities. This is the precuneus area, which is part of the theory of mind network. We did think that actually goes aligned with our uh, hypothesis um, that conceptualization related areas might be more linked to end of close pauses because theory of mind activities are related to conceptualization. I talk, I go, uh, I discuss this in more detail uh, later. 
So first, uh, when it comes to mid-close poses, again, our hypothesis was confirmed. We did find that mid-close posing uh, related to activation in language-related areas. So again, uh, our neuroscience data really nicely uh, aligned with the psycholinguistic data we found in previous SLA research. When it comes to end close poses, again, these were related to theory of mind activities, and we assume that it's actually fine, and it, does, it goes well with our um, assumption, because theory of mind activities can relate to conceptualization. What, is the theory, what do we mean by theory of mind activities? The theory of mind system underlines humans' ability to understand others' beliefs, desires, and intentions. So when we speak and when we communicate, when we talk to somebody, we always need to rely on uh, uh, of this particular system. It's an essential part of uh, social inter interaction and verbal communication. So we thought this is actually quite logical if you think about the type of tasks we had, um, because we asked participants to imagine that they in somebody's place, they have to decide who to take from that uh, from that rooftop in the in the task that I show you. So they had to act, they had to use their theory of mind uh, uh, framework. They needed to infer what someone would do in that situation. So it probably had to do when they were planning what to say and uh, how to act in that situation. What do we know about the theory of mind network in previous uh, neuroscience research? We do know that it plays a key role in any sort of language-based communication. This has been shown previously when it comes to written comprehension. This framework, this uh, system seems to be involved uh, when it comes to reasoning about intentions and mental states. When it comes to written comprehension, there are a few studies which show that. And uh, our collaborator, uh, Haiyuan Zhang Zhang, also found uh, in her own research that theory of mind network is involved in communication uh, or speech production, I should say, but that happens for communication and not just using uh, you know, speech production without a communicative intent. So theory of mind seems to be involved in, in speaking activities as well. In her study, however, this was a really controlled experiment. Participant could only say a noun or you know, a sentence like somebody is uh, playing the piano or talking to, to somebody, but just you know, one sentence and not longer. And the innovation of our study was that it was relatively spontaneous uh, speech production, as spontaneous as it gets in a, in a fMRI scanner. But participants could produce, and they did produce, longer uh, stretch, uh, stretches of, of speech. So what are the implications uh, of this research and what, do, what did we find? First of all, it was interesting for us to see that actually our um, assumptions that were derived from psycholinguistic research uh, were nicely triangulated with the neuroscience data. Indeed, uh, mid-close and end-close poses were associated with the processes, uh, neuro, um, science, uh, neuro um, uh, cognitive processes that we assume they would be. But we also found, which was interesting, that the neuroimaging data actually gave us additional insights that we might not have seen uh, just based on behavioral data. We might have assumed that the theory of mind network is involved, but this is not something we would have figured out just based on the um, psycholinguistic data uh, we had. So in a way, the triangulation of these two data sources led to uh, new insights. We think or we hope that uh, cognitive neuroscience uh, researchers will also be interested in this because we also provide new information about theory of mind effects. Because as I mentioned earlier, previous research in this area has focused on written narrative comprehension, but not so, this is one of the first studies to look at spontaneous uh, speech production. So the theory of mind network is involved in spontaneous speech production as well. Right. So I've just said this, that from a methodological perspective, we also think this is interesting because we managed to provide and combine these two uh, data uh, sources. But of course, the study has a number of limitations. If you've ever been in an fMRI machine, it's definitely not an ecologically valid uh, speech uh, performance, but it's doable. Uh, it, can, it can be done. Um, one limitation of the study, um, among many, is that we triangulated two data sources, but it would have been really interesting to ask participants uh, to tell us what they were thinking during those poses through a stimulated recall procedure. So hopefully in the future, we will also be able to do that and, and have these three data sources. So we also have some insight to participants' conscious uh, thought processes. 
What are we doing next? As I mentioned, we have the L1 data, so it will be really interesting to see how the L2 and L1 data compare, especially in this type of experiments. When you do something new and you don't have a baseline, having a baseline is, is really important. So we're in the process of analyzing uh, that data set. Um, as you might have guessed, those of you doing task-based research, we had the task complexity manipulation as well. Uh, I haven't talked about that, but we also look at whether you know, that choice between who to take in this case is more uh, simple and more complex, whether it does make a difference uh, in terms of neurocognitive processes. And we would also like to relate the process data to linguistic measures, and we have the data to do that. So hopefully that will happen in the um, um, future as well. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, again, I'm happy to answer, but if these are, as I mentioned earlier, I'm uh, more of a psycholinguist SLA researcher here, so I might not be able to answer your uh, more uh, neuroscience-related questions. Parvani, I think, was the first. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, fantastic. Uh, really, really uh, making a We haven't done it, but we have the data, so it's a, it's a really good idea. Yeah, we could go back and we would, of course, we would only be able to look at the performance data, right? But just, um, but but we could make some, I mean, we don't have stimulated equal, but that's a good idea. And I, I should also mention Shungo Suzuki here, who has uh, done most of the coding and he's a, an expert in, in this area. So I'm sure uh, we, could, we could do this. Yes, and, and I can relate your, your question to, to writing research where we, we haven't you know, done this study with, again, we stimulated recall, but that's what we find in writing as well. But when it comes to posing between words, within words, there's a larger percentage which relates to linguistic encoding, but not all of those poses relate to that. So yeah, it would be, yeah definitely. Thank you for that comment and suggestion. Jean-Marc. I have a question about the possible individual differences between the top two. I would be really interested to see whether the more proficient students mm -hmm. had maybe more fewer differences, whether they were different in nature. Um, haven't done this yet, but again, we can because we have uh, proficiency data and we, we did think about this at our last meeting. Yeah, we are, so yeah, hopefully we will be able to do that. And then the assumptions uh, are cl uh, uh, clear, but we would think right that there would be more language related posing probably and more mid close causes depending on for lower proficiency learners. Yes. Oh, yeah. Hmm, that's really interesting. And maybe I'm going to defer the question to, uh, the, <laughs> to Parvani, who has done research in this area, right? Well, the research, existing research evidence clearly suggests that our L1 fluency is related to the language that we have analysis of the L1 data. 
Yeah, uh, um, that's one of the reasons actually why we had the L1 data, not just because of a, a baseline, but indeed because personality factors, right, and, and individual style uh, does make a, a difference in terms of speech. And in terms of cross linguistic differences, it's not uh, a this study. Cross linguistic differences meaning like different L2s or depending on, on the target language. Um, we did find. Yes, I, maybe I, I might. Um, um, answer this question in a different study we had um, we had japanese l1 speakers and uh, uh, l1 uh, spanish speakers uh, speaking l2 uh, english and we did find that the spanish speakers had a lot more um, field pauses uh, than the japanese speakers so there is a i'm not sure whether it would relate to different uh, underlying processes but that would be something interesting to pursue and i think Nivia de Jong has a, um, a study on on this i don't remember the exact findings but i think she did find some cross linguistic differences there there was a second question you said oh, this was the second question the pilot study this we actually we think of this as a pilot study and we hope to to have a uh, a larger um, um sample size and uh, getting back to jean marc's question we hope to look at not just proficiency but other individual um, difference variables so um yes fingers crossed that we have the resources to do that yes When you're studying the middle course, um, do you pay more attention to the main length of the course? That's a really good question. But for now, we didn't look at length of pausing, but again, we have the data and we, we could do that uh, to some extent. Uh, for now, it was just, uh, you know, uh, we had our post test work, so it was definitely longer than 250 milliseconds, but we didn't con uh, consider length of pausing, but we could and we would like to. Thank you for, uh, for raising that. <laughs> I wouldn't go as far as, as you know, how people are, are born, but I think it relates to what we already uh, talked about. So if you're a fluent Elvan speaker, right, and you, you speak very fast and probably in your add to, if you reach a certain level of proficiency, you might have the same uh, sort of uh, speech style. But, you know, um, when it comes to your first language and if you tend to pause a lot, you think before you say your next sentence, then probably that's going to be reflect, reflected in your add to. So this is why it's really important to look at both L1 and L2 uh, speech data. Having said this, we would expect these differences uh, to be, I mean, what we would like, uh, what we would expect to be consistent is end close pausing, right? Because it, if our predictions are correct, and it seems to be that there's a lot of research suggesting that they are, that mid close pausing has a lot more to do with proficiency. Okay, so that there we would see um, differences regardless of your speech style, whether you're a slower speaker or a, or a faster speaker. Thank you. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> We haven't looked at that yet. I mean, maybe proficiency is probably going to, to play a role, but these were, in terms of, I think this will be interesting to see when we, we compare with the L1 data as well, if I understand the, the question correctly, but the L1, we don't, it's being coded at the moment. We don't have the results yet. I'm not sure I answered Peter's question. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, uh, um, I'm not sure I can <laughs> this time, but I. Did you find significant differences in number of new courses or more complex versions of class? And how were some practices operated? 
Okay, uh, now I'm trying to repeat the question. <laughs> so the question was whether there was any difference in terms of complexity, right? That was one of the questions. And the first one was, and how complexity was operationalized. Yes, um, again, we don't have the data uh, yet, but what we looked at is reasoning demands. So when you remember there was that uh, choice, uh, who to take, for example, in the case of the fire chief task, in some of, uh, not fire chief, but the, you know, a fire task, in some of those cases, we had those uh, people who could be taken. The choice was quite straightforward. So there would be someone on crutches, someone with a baby, and the others healthy young people. So don't remember the exact details. So we thought that it would be more straightforward who seemed more vulnerable, who, who you would take. And in other cases, it, it would be less straightforward. So it was really a moral judgment or it, depending on your values, who uh, you would be more likely to take. This was our, we tried to, uh, operationalize intentional reasoning. Okay. Shall I introduce Anna or? Okay. Oh. Okay, our next speaker is my colleague, Ana Palisa Sanchez from the IOE uh, University uh, College London. Ana is Associate Professor uh, in the Center for Applied Linguistics. Her main research areas are vocabulary acquisition, reading, and she's done a lot of exciting work on multimodality and multimodal uh, viewing. Uh, she has published numerous papers in the best journals possible. She's also the author of an edited uh, collection of phonetic sequences and an author of a monograph on eye check she, that's uh, one of the methodologies she tends to use uh, most often. She's also the convener of the BAL uh, vocab uh, SIG. So it's a great pleasure to introduce her here. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Well, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea, for the introduction. And thanks, um, everyone, for coming and being here today. And um, so what I'm going to do today is to, um, um, in this presentation, I'm going to report results uh, of a study that I conducted with uh, my colleagues to our web from uh, Western uh, University in Canada, <clears throat> uh, where we explored the role of lexical coverage in reading. So as we all know, uh, reading is a key component of second language proficiency, and it's crucial to achieve um, and to develop uh, literacy in a second language. Um, so one of the main concerns of reading researchers has been then to, to look for and examine what are the predictors of reading comprehension. And numerous studies have shown that there are many different factors that predict reading comprehension, including syntactic skills, decoding skills, working memory, uh, and the ability to build a mental model of uh, the text. And among all these factors, one that has received a lot of attention from researchers is uh, the role of vocabulary knowledge. So many studies have um, explored this relationship and they've shown a strong positive um, correlation between vocabulary knowledge, both um, uh, breadth and depth, and reading uh, comprehension. And within this, um, so as I was saying, Many vocabulary researchers and reading researchers have looked at this relationship. And within this uh, um, um, relation between reading and vocabulary, one that has also um, received um, a, a lot of attention from researchers is this idea of lexical coverage, which is what I'm gonna focus on uh, today and what we explored in this study. So lexical coverage is uh, defined as the percentage of known words uh, in a text. And, um, Although we, uh, of course, know that there are many different factors affecting uh, and predicting reading comprehension, lexical coverage has been considered one of the most influential, most important uh, uh, factors affecting comprehension. 
So when we think about lexical coverage, I think we can identify two kind of, of, of lines of research and two main strands. Um, so some studies have looked at the percentage of known words in a given text uh, that it's important and that it's necessary, they're necessary to know in order to achieve adequate comprehension. And the other line of research or the other, uh, the other strand is to explore uh, the vocabulary size needed uh, in order to attain and obtain that uh, coverage. So in this presentation, I'm gonna focus on this first line uh, of research. So the percentage of known words in a text that are important to achieve uh, adequate uh, comprehension. So this is what we know so far in the context of reading, as we have a few studies that have explored these, um, um, this relationship. In the um, Laufer study in 1989, uh, she found uh, that and concluded that 95% coverage was needed for reasonable comprehension of a general academic text. So learners needed to know basically 95% of the words in a text in order to achieve reasonable comprehension. The figures, as you can see in the different studies, have really ranged from 95 to 98. Um, in the um, study by Hugh and Nation in 2000, uh, they suggested that it was actually 98% coverage uh, that was required for what they call adequate comprehension of a fiction text. Um, in the study by Schmidt, Young and Grabe um, in 2011, they didn't really specify a particular threshold, but they found a linear relationship uh, between lexical coverage and comprehension, but they concluded that 98% was really necessary if we wanted learners to achieve scores in the comprehension test higher than uh, 60%. And finally, in the study by Laufer uh, and uh, Ravenhorst Kalowski in 2010, uh, they found and they suggested that maybe we kind of we could identify two um, um, uh, percentages. So maybe 95 was uh, uh, required for minimal comprehension, and then 98 if we really uh, uh, wanted to achieve optimal comprehension. And these figures were also confirmed uh, for the context of uh, listening in the Van Zilen and Schmidt study. So overall, we see figures ranging from 95 to 98. In general, a high percentage of words in a text need to be known to achieve adequate comprehension. And um, from these studies, uh, researchers tend to uh, suggest that it's probably the higher, the 98% uh, figure, if we're really uh, uh, talking about adequate comprehension of the different uh, you know, ideas and details in a text. So this is really what we know about lexical coverage uh, uh, figures and the evidence that is out there. And these figures are really important because they've been used to, um, um, to justify the selection of reading materials. And this is not just in, uh, in research, but also in teaching. So we calculate, we very often calculate the coverage of a particular text and we say, oh yeah, there was a 98% or 97% coverage. So students should be fine with this, uh, with this text and they should understand um, and have no comprehension difficulties. Uh, and also these figures are really important because they are being used to, uh, to set important vocabulary learning targets in, in, uh, in teaching. But it's important that we remember as Webb recently uh, um, um, argued that with these few studies that we have and the few variables that may affect uh, comprehension having been examined really, the discussions of how generalizable these figures are, are likely to be overstated. So we certainly need, this is, I believe, an area within vocabulary research where we need uh, more um, studies. And what I found really um, interesting is that these, um, these coverage figures are also used to make assumptions about not comprehension, but also, for example, learning. So in vocabulary learning studies, we often report uh, coverage figures and say, well, the text had a 98% coverage, so learners should be fine, and, and therefore they should be able to learn uh, incidentally from, uh, from, from context. But we really don't have empirical evidence to show that that's indeed the case. And we also make assumptions that because the lexical coverage was uh, 98 or 97.5, uh, then the, uh, the actual reading of the text should be easy and it should be it shouldn't really uh, um, like learners shouldn't really make any effort in reading the um, uh, the text but again this is not something that we have uh, really evidence for so <clears throat> 
So what I, the studies that I showed were really looking at lexical covers for comprehension. There are a couple of studies that have tried to look beyond comprehension. So we have the study by Liu and Nation in 1985. Uh, they looked at the ability to infer from context, and they found that probably around 96% was necessary for successful guessing of the words from context. And more recently, uh, Laufe identified that both 95 and 98% uh, coverage was, um, were better and led to uh, significantly higher scores than the 90% uh, condition for inferencing. And what she's suggesting, and that was really uh, interesting, that the lexical threshold should probably consist of a combination of site vocabulary, so the, 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 the words that learners and readers uh, know, even out of context, and inferred vocabulary, the vocabulary that they can actually infer from context. But again, this is everything that we have, to my knowledge, uh, on lexical coverage. We don't have studies looking at lexical coverage and vocabulary learning, or uh, the effect of lexical coverage and cognitive effort and online processing of texts. So this is uh, what we try to do in this study, is start to really uh, explore some of these aspects, really trying to provide a more comprehensive understanding of, of the role of lexical coverage. So we wanted to investigate the effect that uh, different percentages of lexical coverage had on comprehension, but also the ability to learn, incidentally, from, uh, from the text, the ability to infer the meaning of words from context, also participants perceived difficulty, how they felt, uh, um, um, how difficult they perceived the text uh, to be, and also their online processing efforts, so how the text was actually read. So this is what we <clears throat> did in this um, study. The participants were 94 advanced uh, speakers of English, postgraduate students. In the UK, they were from a range of L1 backgrounds, and they had around uh, six to 7,000 uh, uh, words as for um, vocabulary size. Um, they, were, they were asked to read a story from the Hue and Nation study, so we used the materials from that study. Uh, the escaped madman was the, the, the name of the story, it was a short uh, narrative, and there were four different versions. And the way, so one for each of the, of the lexical coverage percentages. So we had a 90% 90, 90 version, 95, 98, and 100. So the way we, uh, the, these uh, conditions were designed were by replacing low frequency words with pseudo words. So, so that way we could, uh, um, we could be sure that they would know all the words in the story except for the target items. So we could manipulate the lexical coverage percentages. So in the 90% version, there were 10% of uh, pseudo words, 5% in the 95% uh, um, condition, 2% in the 98, and in the control 100% condition, they were all high frequency words that everybody would be familiar with. The pseudo words were also from the Hue and Nation study. <clears throat> All target words that we included in the analysis appeared one to two times. There were a few words, but very few, six words, uh, sorry, pseudo words that were deleted because they appeared significantly higher uh, um, number of times. So one word appeared five times and another one four times. So we deleted them and just included those that appear one to two times and were consistent across uh, the conditions. And as I was saying, all remaining words uh, from the text were from the uh, uh, three most uh, frequent, 3,000 most frequent words in, uh, in English. And we assume that since these were advanced learners of English, they would be very familiar with these uh, words. So measurement instruments. So for the offline measures, the tests that they completed, um, so we asked them to complete a comprehension test. This was also the same test used by Hue and Nation. It was a 14 item multiple choice test. Then we also asked them to, we present them with the list of pseudo words in their condition and ask them to recall the meaning with uh, a definition, translation, synonym, whatever uh, they uh, wanted. The inferencing test was also a recall test. So at the end, we gave them the text again and asked them to guess the meaning of those pseudo words from context. And we also asked them to rate the text difficulty in a scale from one to 10. As for the online measures, we use recordings of their own movements. So we used uh, iLink 1000 plus to, um, uh, to measure and record 
their eye movements while they read the text. So that gives us information about how fast the test was read, number of fixations, so the number of times they stop in different words, and the length of the fixation, so the duration of those fixations for how long they were fixating on different parts in the text, and also the saccades, the movements from different uh, points in the text. And this uh, gives us an opportunity to see whether, and this is what we were assuming, that the more words learners and readers knew in a text, the faster and more fluent the reading of that text. That was the assumption, but we'll see what we found. So we looked at three, as you will see, three um, uh, measures of, um, of text reading, average fixation duration, the number of fixations and number of saccades. So as the procedure, they could, typical procedure in a reading study, they read a text, then afterwards they completed the vocabulary recall test, comprehension test, difficulty rating, and then finally the inferencing. Participants were randomly assigned to one of the conditions, and there were no significant differences in vocabulary size among the four uh, groups. So they had a similar level of, um, of vocabulary knowledge. The analysis, we had a range of dependent variables and then the independent variable, the variable sorry, was lexical coverage with four levels for comprehension and eye movements because we included the 100 version and three levels for vocabulary learning, um, inferencing and uh, text difficulty. And we used, depending on the normal distribution of the data, we analyzed the role of the independent variable on the dependent variable with either kruskal wallis test on one way um, ANOVAs. So let's see what we found. Starting with comprehension, so we have the four conditions there and the um, mean scores. And as expected, as we, uh, we see, an increase in comprehension with the increase in lexical coverage. And that's what we expect. So, so far, so good. But uh, what we found, and there was a significant difference, um, in um, across the groups, but postdoc tests showed that the difference was really between the 100 condition and the 90 and 95, but there were no differences across 98, 95 uh, and 90. <clears throat> So another way to look at the effect of comprehension, and this is what previous studies have done, and we wanted to basically do the same, is to look at the number of learners uh, that actually reached a particular comprehension, uh, and, and they got a particular percentage of comprehension in the comprehension test. So we look at that. These are the, uh, the loads of percentages. <laughs> so we have the percentages in terms of lexical coverage, the conditions, 90, 95, 98, and 100. And then we have the comprehension thresholds. So these are different thresholds that have been examined in the literature, 55%, 70, and 85. So if we look at 55%, the first row, pretty much all the learners over 80, um, over 85% of the learners actually got that comprehension <clears throat> in all conditions. In the 70% condition, we see that more than 80% of the learners actually got that comprehension from 95 uh, onwards, but not so much in the 90% condition. So that was more difficult if we aim for a 70 uh, percentage uh, scores in the comprehension test. And finally, uh, and this is what the, um, the a study by Hugh and Nation, and following them, what we did was to focus on this 85% comprehension, which has been considered uh, necessary for adequate comprehension, uh, optimum, sorry, comprehension. What we found here that it's really uh, in the first two conditions, 90 and 95, so when people only know 90% or 95% of the words in the text, really not many people actually got that level of comprehension. So it was really from the 98% uh, condition that we get more than half of the participants getting that level of comprehension. So if we are aiming for that 85% comprehension, so that level of optimum comprehension, as previous studies have suggested, we're really looking at 98% um, of lexical coverage onwards. 
In terms of incidental learning, we were really not expecting many gains, obviously, because these words, these pseudo words were presented only once or twice. This was a very short text, very short reading activity, but we still wanted to see whether there would be differences across conditions. And we found very similar, very uh, 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 low scores and very similar across conditions, a, a bit higher in the 95%, but the results of the Kruskal Wally test showed that it wasn't, sorry, it wasn't statistically, uh, so there were no differences across conditions at all in, term of, in terms of vocabulary knowledge, all uh, the same. Uh, in terms of lexical inferencing, also as we expect, we see clearly an increase in the number of words that people could infer from context with an increase in, um, uh, in lexical coverage. So the more words you know in a text, uh, the better your ability to infer the meaning of the remaining words from context, which makes sense. Uh, but again, we see that, uh, so there was a significant difference, but the difference was between the 90 and the 98% condition. So learners in the 98% condition were able to infer more words than those in the 90% uh, percent condition, which makes sense. So there seems to be um, an advantage of the 98% uh, coverage in terms of lexical, the ability to infer the meaning from context. <clears throat> so, these uh, scores of um, you know, the vocabulary learning and also the lexical inferencing analysis were including, of course, there were, uh, we looked at percentages because by design there were a different number of words in each condition. So we were thinking that these patterns could also be due to the fact that the pseudo words were different across conditions. So we ran the analysis again, looking at the, end, uh, at the 11 common items. So the common pseudo words that appear across uh, conditions. And overall, while the descriptive statistics are uh, really similar, so in vocabulary learning, we see pretty much uh, very similar scores, a little bit higher in the 95% condition, but very similar. For lexical inferencing, we see the same, more higher scores uh, with increased lexical coverage, but the um, results of the analysis show that there were no significant differences across conditions. So when we look at um, the common items across conditions, that significant difference that we saw for lexical uh, inferencing, kind of disappears. So <clears throat> in terms of vocabulary learning and lexical uh, inferencing, really there were no differences across uh, the different conditions. And looking at the online measures, so how people read the text, as I was saying at the beginning, we were expecting more fluent, faster uh, processing of the text with increased uh, exposure, uh, sorry, with increased uh, lexical coverage. And uh, this is kind of what we found in the, if we look at the, uh, the mean scores for average fixation duration, we see that they are, uh, so the reading, the, the duration of, of fixations uh, is faster with increased uh, lexical coverage. So if you know more words, so obviously in the 100% condition where learners knew all the words, the reading was faster, but, these differences, surprisingly, and this is not what we expected, were not significant. Um, in, so it, we didn't find any significant differences across any, uh, in any of the measures that we looked at. So this actually suggests that the actual reading of the text was very similar uh, in the three conditions, 90, 95, or 98. <clears throat> In terms of perceived difficulty, we did see a, an, an, um, a significant difference. Again, as we expected, people rated, uh, so the text was rated as, as easier to read with increased uh, lexical coverage. So um, the more words you know, uh, learners knew in a text, the easier the text was perceived to be, even though it wasn't really reflected in the actual reading of the text, there was a difference in the perception of difficulty. And um, we found, so there was again a significant difference between the 98% condition, which was rated as significantly easier than the uh, 90%. So to conclude, what have we seen in this, in this uh, study, in this preliminary analysis, in terms of comprehension, we did find a significant effect of comprehension, but if you remember, it was really between the 100% um, um, the condition and the 90 and 95. So there were no differences um, between 90, 95, and 90, and sorry, and 98 
um, uh, conditions. When we look at the level of adequate or optimum comprehension, we did see that um, the majority of participants reached that level of comprehension in the 98% condition. So that is really in line with what we've seen in previous studies, that we, if we are aiming for that uh, level of comprehension, of optimum comprehension, we're really looking at a 98% um, uh, coverage figure. In vocabulary learning, no significant effect of lexical coverage on vocabulary learning, so they seem to learn uh, in a similar way, uh, regardless of the amount of words that they don't know in the text. Lexical inferencing, we, uh, we saw initially a significant effect with uh, the 98% um, um, coverage condition leading to higher gains than the 90%. But then when we look at the common items, this effect actually disappeared. Um, so the patterns on that initial significant effect might actually be due to differences in the items and not so much about the uh, due to the lexical the percentage of lexical coverage with perceived difficulty we did find a significant effect and the 98 percent condition was weighted as significantly easier which also makes sense um, in terms of online processing, this is not what we expected, but when we've looked at these three measures of overall text reading, actually there's no, um, there were no significant, um, there was no significant effect. Uh, and so it means that a lower percentage of lexical coverage doesn't really lead to increased cognitive effort, at least in the analysis that we've um, completed. So overall, what we've seen when we try to actually look at lexical coverage across a, a, a variety of measures is that the, the lexical coverage percentages really seem to have a different effect on comprehension, learners' ability to learn from the text, their ability to infer from context, their perceptions of difficulty and how they actually process and read the text. So I think this at least clearly shows that before we use the, the, what we know about lexical coverage figures to make assumptions and claims about you know how the text is read and how uh, people will be able to learn or infer from context uh, we have to be careful and we really need more research before we we can make uh, um you know assumptions and claims and valid claims about uh, these issues so of course there's some limitations that point us in uh, uh, to you know future important future directions in terms of vocabulary learning we know we use a very challenging test a meaning recall test is very challenging and it would be good in future studies to also use meaning recognition which tends to be easier and tap into um, you know kind of earlier levels of uh, vocabulary um, learning um, we also need to um, look at all the components of lexical mastery, so uh, it would be nice to include a battery of, of vocabulary tests to further look into vocabulary knowledge from um, uh, reading. Uh, we need to explore the interaction between lexical coverage with other lexical and, and textual features, and I think this is something that is coming clear from this study, that there is a range of factors that would affect that, not only lexical coverage, so we really need to look at the interaction uh, among all those different factors. In terms of online processing, we haven't seen any differences in this analysis, so it might be the case that for us to see increased cognitive effort when reading a text, we need to look at lower coverages. So we chose the ones that have been explored in terms of comprehension, but it will be interesting to look at 70% or 80%. So when learners and when readers know, you know, way fewer lower, uh, words in a text, maybe that's where we see the effect. So this is something that we should really uh, explore. Um, we uh, exploring the processing of the actual pseudo words, the unknown vocabulary. This is what we are working on uh, at the moment. So the measures in terms of eye movements, the measures that I presented today are just uh, three global measures of, of text reading. But uh, we are now looking at the actual reading of the pseudo words and we expect to see probably a difference uh, there. Because if, if there are more words that, um, um, that are unknown in a text, the resources that you have left to actually focus on the, 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 the unknown vocabulary might be um, um, fewer. So we'll see. But that's what we're working on at the moment. Also examine a wider range of measures uh, in terms of, uh, of online uh, processing. 
doing studies where we can actually control for the text and the contextual cues would be really important because, of course, inferencing ability and learning would depend on that. And we know that that's an important factor, but this is something we couldn't manipulate because we were using the original text from, from Hue and Nation, but it would be quite interesting to do in the future. And um, important, very important, uh, looking at readers of different proficiencies. I mean, as we've seen from the beginning, we really have four or five studies that have looked at these. And each of these studies have looked at different types of texts, narratives, academic texts, different proficiencies. So really, if we, if we want, and it's important that we have a good idea of, of, of the effect of this um, factor. And I think, um, yeah, looking at, running the same studies, but with uh, different groups of proficiency will be uh, very important because some of the differences that we observe across the studies will be due to those um, differences in, in the proficiencies of participants. And I think that's everything I wanted to say. Yes, uh, thank you very much for listening. And yeah. <laughs> Uh, I have a question about um, possible interactions uh, between um, textual coverage and um, familiarity with the topic. Yeah, absolutely. Because I have, uh, I have a receptive um, knowledge of German and Portuguese at A1 level, yet I can read and understand an abstract Elaphite linguistics in that language. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't. It is, and in this case, we chose um, a narrative that you know was kind of very easy for everyone. But this is something that, if if I'm not wrong, one of the studies looked at. I think the study by Schmidt, uh, Young, and Grabby, they looked at um, um, background knowledge of the topic. They actually ask uh, readers to read two different texts with different levels of familiarity, and they found a clear effect. The more familiar you are um, uh, with the text. The, the, the more you can tolerate in terms of unknown vocabulary. And that makes sense. That's what I was saying is, is very tricky how we use these coverage figures because it really depends on the topic uh, that, that, that learners are, are, are reading about. So the topic of the text, how familiar you are with that, background knowledge. So all those things are things that we definitely need to control. We didn't look at, at that in this particular study because um, you know it was an easy narrative, but uh, it would be really important, I think, to consider that in future studies. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot. That's an excellent question. Um, the so the use of oh yeah sorry sorry I should repeat the question. Sorry about that. So the question is about the use of uh, pseudo words and whether that uh, would uh, influence uh, behavior because learners, advanced learners, might be aware of of that. Um, so. This is a, a, a really important methodological decision in this type of vocabulary uh, uh, learning studies. In vocabulary research, it's very common uh, to use pseudo words as target vocabulary to control for previous knowledge, especially when we're dealing with advanced learners and with a relatively easy text. It's difficult, um, it might be difficult to find words that nobody, uh, uh, enough words that nobody's familiar with before that they've never seen before. So this is really uh, the research on why we use pseudo words. As whether that influences or not, that's a really a good question. And what we did as well was to actually ask. So there was a sort of interview at the end and we asked, did you notice that there were some words that you didn't know and what did you think they were? So interesting because, because precisely of that, because we were thinking, and again, this is something that I've done in different studies that I've always asked because you always think, my God, as soon as they start reading, they're going to find, oh, the study is about these words that, you know, I've never seen before. So actually, the majority of, of students, of participants said that they thought they're kind of 
um, used to read and find words they don't know sometimes, even at advanced levels. So they all thought that they were like either slang words. So they all noticed that there were some words that they didn't know, of course, uh, but they all felt that they were either slang words or kind of old English words that they didn't know. So they all thought that they were forms uh, that they were not familiar uh, with, but not necessarily that they were invented words that were the focus of the study. So ask whether they would pay more attention. I mean, that's, that's a good uh, empirical question. I like to compare whether, you know, if you use, if you use pseudo words or low frequency real words, whether the behavior would be different. I think that's a, that's a really, uh, you know, it's a good uh, empirical question in itself. But, uh, you know, when we design and when we select these pseudo words, we try to make them look like, um, you know, like low frequency uh, real words. But that's a very good point. And that's something that now, whenever I now use pseudo words, I always do, I always ask them at the end, did you notice the presence of these words and what did you think they were? Um, to kind of rule out the possibility that they actually, you know, knew that from the beginning. But that's an excellent point. Thanks for raising that question. Hello. Just a quick follow-up question on the words. And I think I know what you might explain the impact of the word that we'll have. So not in these, oh, sorry. So the question was whether in terms of the zero words, whether we manipulated syntactic position of the, of the zero words in the text. So not in this study, because we used the text that, um, uh, th that was used in the Hue and Nation study, and we used those pseudo words. So we didn't manipulate uh, the position. And again, they were across, uh, the, the, they were nouns and adjectives and, and um, noun adjectives, and, uh, and I think there were three or four adverbs. So they were of different parts of the speech. And it, but it was the same story and in the same kind of positions across conditions, but if, you're, if, if, uh, if I were to do this again, and you know, I would create and manipulate a text and control, as I was saying, for contextual cues, but also the position of the pseudo words, because of course that would, and that's what I've done in other studies um, that I've conducted, trying to control for all those factors as much as possible. But this is not something that we did here because we were just using, we, we wanted to basically use the same materials to see whether we would get um, the comparable results. But yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Eloy. Victoria? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jean Marc. <laughs> so, the question is whether. Um... Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, <laughs> as you can read, <laughs> in, in any case, the question is about um, the, the lexical core, so the, the vocabulary of the, the remaining words, the first the K, 2K, and 3K, right? Uh, An academic, oh yes, I can see that. Uh, about the lexical coverage of frequency word levels, one, two, three, K, and academic vocabularies, are they the same in the four readings? Yes, it was exactly the same. Uh, text, so we control for um, uh, the, the remaining, other than the pseudo words, all the, all the remaining words were from the first uh, uh, 3K uh, levels. I don't remember now the specific distribution for, you know, first K, 2K and 3K, um, but, you know, with people we are really working with advanced uh, users of, uh, of English and their vocabulary size was around 7,000. So they had a good vocabulary knowledge. So we would expect that e even if there were, you know, more words from the second, uh, from the 2K or from the uh, first K or 3K, that, that wouldn't really make a difference because they were uh, familiar with uh, all words from the first 3K. I don't remember the specific distribution across those three uh, levels, but they were all, in all conditions, the, the remaining words were from the first uh, 3K levels. Sorry, say again. I was trying to read something else. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and it was it was an important. Um, so the question is, 
I'll repeat it just in case, whether the um, uh, participants' perception of how they did in the comprehension test influenced influence their uh, rating of the, of the difficulty of the text. Yes, it could. Uh, it was very difficult to decide when to ask different things because in, and this is the, um, the problem when you try to um, examine different outcome measures and different, uh, different uh, um, variables within the same study. And you know, we had to think very carefully, there is gonna be an effect and there is gonna be an influence of some tests over other. So, so yes, it could. Uh, I mean, rating the difficulties, the last thing that they did, so it could have been, um, it, could, it could have been influenced by their perception of how they did in the comprehension test. Yeah, absolutely. The thing is that if there was an influence, it would have been the same across conditions because everybody followed the same procedure. But yes, it could, it could. Mm-hmm. Yep. Sorry, the last part? Yeah. Yes, and this is interesting because we also have some interview data that we haven't actually looked at. And within the same uh, coverage condition, you also find individual differences that we haven't so here we've also uh, sorry we've only looked at group performance but there were i mean learners tolerance for 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 the existence of a known vocabulary in a text is very different and also uh, you know your ability to infer so inferencing ability so yes there were so the, the the answer the short answer would be yes there were differences within conditions and this would be something really you know important and interesting to look at we haven't looked at that in the data, I think some of these differences will emerge from the uh, from the interview from the qualitative uh, data, but we haven't looked at that yet. But it would be nice to measure and to include some sort of uh, a measure of language ability and other individual differences because it, it it will have an effect. Would I quickly just yeah. suggest that one typical source would be tolerance of ambiguity. Yeah. Which is something that. We yeah and and the interesting thing as well is that that would probably be related to what we were saying earlier topic familiarity i mean with certain types of texts we might uh, be expecting uh, or we might be more comfortable finding words that we don't know with other types of texts you might not expect uh, to find um, uh, words that you don't know so I think that would be also uh, be related to topic familiarity and, and, and background knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Andrea. Yeah. That's that it was really a practical decision because we did it. Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> my god, you can see my, my memory here is uh, great. Uh, sorry about that. So, the question uh, by Andrea is um, whether it's about the vocabulary measures that we use that I've mentioned. Uh, we went for a challenging meaning recall test, and why uh, we whether we were optimistic and why we went uh, for that, whether we were expecting more. We did, we were not. I mean, given the the length of the text and uh, the the amount of words and the, the number of times. I mean, based on what we know from research, we were not expecting uh, many gains at all. It was really a more more of a practical decision because we wanted to look at. We did we didn't want the experiment to be too long and we were already including quite a few things and the interview at the end so it was really a practical decision we would have liked to include more uh, more measures but uh, we also felt that that was going to especially for the other conditions it was okay but for the 90 percent condition it was already an hour and a half because there were a lot of pseudo words so you know we had to so that the vocabulary tests would have been quite long so it was really a practical decision but uh, it would have been good to include uh, to include more measures 
but we were not particularly optimistic, uh, optimistic about vocabulary learning uh, from the onset, really. We, we were not expecting uh, gains, uh, many gains at all, but we were interested to see whether there would be differences across conditions, because we thought, well, maybe the gains are going to be very, very small, but in the 98% condition, there's going to be uh, you know, a significant uh, effect there. So that's what we were really interested in, but we were not expecting uh, yeah, them to learn many of these words. <laughs> Yeah. What we find, I mean, that's that's a very interesting point and a very interesting remark. Um, what we find in previous studies is actually that you know you really need to go up to ninety eight percent to find uh, you know very high levels of comprehension for the majority of learners. I mean, the reason is because, as we were saying, you know, vocabulary knowledge has a very important effect on comprehension. So if you, you know, the number of words that you know in a text really influence how well you uh, you understand. So I think the reason is because of the importance uh, of, of vocabulary for, for comprehension. But this is really in line with uh, what we find in um, generally in research that when we look at comprehension, we really, and, and you are aiming for you know, an 85% score in a comprehension test, um, you're really looking at, at very, uh, you know, uh, high uh, levels of lexical coverage. So you really need to know um, quite a lot of uh, words in the, in the text. Absol well, absolutely. In any study on L2 reading, we know that L1 reading abilities will have an effect. Also, I think, and something that I haven't really discussed in, in detail, I mean, it's, you can guess uh, from the different percentages that I presented, but in terms of comprehension, it all depends on what, what does it mean for you to reach adequate comprehension and optimal comprehension. So in research, we, uh, uh, researchers have made this distinction between minimal and optimal, but really this depends, I mean, in certain situations, maybe an 80% coverage is okay because you're just trying to get the main idea. So it really depends on how, in all these studies, one important thing is how you define uh, comprehension. Exactly. So, and these will vary depending on the, on the individual uh, learner and the situation. So, so, you know, too many things to consider. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in these type of uh, studies, um, again, if we are looking at also vocabulary knowledge and le um, not with lexical inferencing, we, we did allow them to explore the whole context. But uh, in the first reading, we didn't allow them to go back to the text and reread again. So that's something that would be different, you know, because this was a controlled uh, uh, experiment. And also when we were looking at eye movements, it was important to control for that. But in real situations, in the majority of cases, people would be able to go back and reread. So that's something else to um, consider. Either. And this is really something that is interesting because if, if you read the literature in, you know, in learning from reading and learning from uh, reading while listening and listening from an experimental perspective, we control for that. But then we also know even when watching movies, I mean, people stop and go back and, 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 and watch the same scene again if they didn't get it. So that's, that's a, I think, a good empirical question to explore, actually. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Vivian. Uh, and and that's that's a very good question. So in this case, we didn't. I would say that um, you know when we the studies that have looked at lexical coverage, we um, focus we focus on the knowledge of the 
compon uh, the different components, the individual words, but we didn't look at uh, knowledge of items beyond the single word. So uh, phrasal verbs, as you mentioned, or any other type of multi-word units. And that would be another thing that uh, would be really important to do. Because so far, at least my understanding is that the four studies that we have available, um, they've controlled for the, the, the number of words known or unknown in the text, but without looking at the um, knowledge of the formulaic sequences. But that is also important because some people might know the components, but they might not know if they are part of a phrase. And that would also affect, I think there is a study by um, Martinez and Murphy, where the act they actually showed that knowledge of the um, uh, uh, formulaic sequences in a text also affected reading comprehension. So that's another thing that would be interesting to do, but we didn't do that in this study. We follow the methodology used in previous studies and, and, and looked at the, the knowledge of the component words. In this case, I mean, it was a very easy uh, story, very easy narrative. So yeah, I, I, I don't think um, that that would have had a, a major effect. And again, it would have been the same across conditions, but it's it's really something uh, interesting to look at and, and um, you know, something I think we should do in the future. Thank, but thanks a lot for the question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. And yeah, and we're gonna have just a ten minutes of the break.
Okay, everyone, everyone, uh, could I have attention? Shall we resume the session again? <clears throat> yeah, let's do it. Everyone, let's resume. I think you need to yell in those microphones. <laughs> Maybe too, yes. yeah, too low in volume. Okay, it should be okay. okay. All right. Everyone, so let's get started once again. <clears throat> And hello, YouTube audience. <laughs> okay, so, okay, cool. My colleague, Anna, is kindly introducing me. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. Hello everyone, welcome back. Hope you've enjoyed the break. So it's my turn to introduce someone who doesn't really uh, need much of an introduction. Uh, Kasper Seiter, <laughs> Associate Professor of Applied Linguistics and Fusel at UCL and member of the Center of Applied Linguistics. He's the person you think of when we talk about L2 speech uh, and speech training. As you all know, he's published extensively in the best journals in the field with over 80 publications, and which together obviously have made a huge contribution uh, to the field of L2 speech auditory processing and pronunciation uh, training. His research has also been funded by main uh, organizations and funding bodies, including Spencer Foundation, Leverhulme Trust, and ESRC. Um, and he's, uh, of course, an active member of the LSLF uh, uh, community and responsible for much, and I would say, our online presence. Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, Kazuya Saito. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Anna. I just wanted to give her a hug, but uh, <laughs> maybe next time, maybe next time or after this presentation. Okay, so uh, uh, over the past, uh, let me just Okay. Over the past 50 years in, a, in the field of SLA, one biggest question is, uh, uh, one of the biggest questions is, uh, what's the best way to learn, teach second language pronunciation? And uh, uh, researchers have also shown that uh, uh, even if you have uh, second language learners with the exact same age and same level of motivation, and let's say they practice a target language the exact same way, spending the exact same amount of time with the same level of intensity, uh, the outcomes are still subject to uh, uh, individual differences in terms of how fast they can learn and also in terms of how far they can go. And uh, there's so many factors affecting these individual differences. And uh, one probably the hotly debated topic as of 2022 in the field of SLA is to identify the source of uh, uh, individual variation. In other words, let's find out the mechanism underlying successful second language speech learning. And again, as I said, there are so many factors, but uh, uh, our team uh, has proposed something very, very simple. Basically, uh, having a good year in a scholarly term, auditory processing, this explains a lot. And <clears throat> what is uh, auditory processing, if you don't know? That is the uh, domain general perceptual ability uh, to encode basic lower order acoustic information. What is it? That's the pitch performance, usually operationalizes hertz, and duration and intensity and because uh, this this skill is is different from the relatively higher order cognitive skills such as attention control and memory and because this is the first skill that you need when you encounter uh, oral language input 
if, if it, any individual variation at this stage is strongly associated with the speed of first language acquisition and also the uh, incidence of language impairment. So in the cognitive psychology, uh, 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 also psycholinguistics, this topic has been researched a lot. And therefore, uh, I formed a research team uh, comprising faculty members, as well as the postdoc and PhD students. And we try to generalize this framework uh, to the context of adult second language speech learning. So here is a very quick summary of what we have found so far. It's obviously uh, everybody can achieve comprehensible, intensible pronunciation. You can be a functional second language user as long as you practice every day, as long as you spend enough time practicing the, the language. But in terms of like, a, again, how far they can go, the ultimate attainment and how fast they can pick up second language pronunciation, we, we can see that there is a great individual variation which is tied to the uh, auditory processing, how, how well, how, how, how small difference you can hear. Okay, so uh, that was the story so far actually. And uh, I, uh, uh, but uh, since then I have been getting a lot of questions from especially uh, young researchers who you know, love this type of new, new topic, but wanna use it in their research program. So our research team has been convinced and we should really uh, release the uh, freely available, downloadable, uh, of offline auditory processing tests that everybody can use by using their own computer for actually not only research, but also teaching purposes. Uh, uh, Ingrid Mora, that is two uh, uh, previous uh, lab members actually took the initiative. So uh, we created a website, which is called the SLA Speech Tools. So this is the first time actually I'm introducing this website to everyone. And um, so this is how you can find uh, if you go to uh, Google and just uh, uh, type uh, SLA uh, speech tools and you can find there. So then you can go there and then this is how, you know, that, what the website looks like. And then as you can see here, this website is not only for the researchers, but also for teachers. So uh, if you go to the teacher tools, and then uh, you can find a range of uh, pronunciation teaching materials that uh, our team has ever used in our research. And you can teach pronunciation explicitly. I'm talking about second language English, but obviously it's important to introduce communicative activities where you can learn second language pronunciation. But most importantly, as you may know, TBLT is now coming to the pronunciation. So that's the, another exciting topic as of 2022. So uh, we have some materials about TBLT and pronunciation there too. But today let's focus on the research tools. And we have uh, offline auditory processing tools as well as a bunch of questionnaire tools that you can also use to, to investigate individual differences in second language speech learning. And huge credits thanks to the uh, Jean-Marc Levalek, he also is a, a very key member for, for this uh, uh, website project as well. So now let's talk about the uh, uh, auditory processing test that we, we, we have created. Now we are sharing with you. So we follow the two-way auditory processing model. So what does that mean? So first important distinction is the type of processing. That's the uh, acuity, uh, how, uh, how small difference you can hear in acoustic signals, one particular acoustic signal. The other one is the audio motor integration. This is the ability that you need to hear something, convert that into some motor action. <clears throat> the other dimension, the uh, 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 crucial dimension is the uh, type of signals. So you are processing uh, spectral, so frequency related information or rhythm, a uh, tempo related information. Uh, uh, and following this model, we have created one, two, three, four, five, six, six uh, individual tests that you can use right away. Okay, so uh, if, if you have ever attended my talk or uh, elsewhere members, I have done this a million times. <laughs> <laughs> I was always laughing that uh, you know, one day I'll release this for general public but today that it has come. So, but for everyone to know what this, what this looks like, I'm gonna do some demo, okay? And uh, for elsewhere members, you have done this a million times, so you should be able to get the right answers today. But anyway, uh, so it's a very simple AXP discrimination task. You hear three sounds, you tell me which one is different, one or three. And this time, uh, this test, uh, acuity and also spectral information. So uh, I, we manipulated the pitch. So let, let's hear and tell me which one is different. The answer is obviously 
<laughs> uh, three, yes, three. Uh, and th this is actually the easiest one, actually. <laughs> so you, as long as you have a normal hearing, you should be able to hear. Okay, let's move on to the task two. Uh, all right. The first one, thank you so much. This is the uh, uh, difference. So the, the, the difference in pitch is only 7.5 uh, 7 hertz. This is the average difference that people can hear. So thank you, so you're average. Then <laughs> let's, let's move on to the last one though. That one is the most difficult one. Probably we recruited uh, more than 2000 participants and there are very few people who could hear this level of difference in pitch. Actually only one hertz, but let's, let's listen. Accent, Oscar. <laughs> you got it. Very good. So uh, the one. Mm. Okay. So 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 good news is you can do this in your research program now, and also the, we use the adaptive uh, mode, meaning that the computer will test you depending on how how you perform a correct in crack, they will find out precisely how small difference you can actually hear. And the one test, so this is a pitch test. So one test takes like a less than five minutes. So it's, it's really a cost effective uh, as well. So then on the top of that, we also created the, uh, uh, the task to measure integration. So audio motor integration, and this time temporal information, so rhythm. So this task is also very, very simple. You hear the melody, uh, so, so in this case, rhythm three times, play three times. And what you're asked to do is to repeat it. So uh, in a computer version, you use a space bar, but I'm gonna do some demonstration by using my, my hands, okay? And after that, you will try, of course. Uh, let's see. So now I need to try. <laughs> that may help. That may help. Yeah. So then, what's really cool is the computer will find out uh, how accurately you actually produce that rhythm. So now it's your turn. Okay? The first one was easy, although I didn't do well. But <laughs> anyway, the second one is a little bit difficult. But you can hear melody play. Uh, sorry, rhythm play three times. You repeat back. Okay. Let's get started. Okay, I want to see your hands. I love Elstaff colleagues. <laughs> they, 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 they didn't give up. Thank you so much. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, uh, by the way, I just want to point out that this, this, this is very interesting. So, computer will find out it takes probably uh, three to five minutes. Uh, and then uh, how accurate, what percentage uh, uh, you can actually reproduce the, the sort of beats. Uh, and, and usually people get somewhere around 70, 80% accuracy, but you can try it out. So I, uh, I can see some of my students actually coming from my, uh, from, from, from my module. Uh, I'm, I'm actually very lucky to have this opportunity to teach this MA module called Second Language Speech. So we have 10 weeks. Every week we talk about my favorite topic, L2 speech. <laughs> so obviously we can stop, you know, keep, keep having a very good, good discussion. But one very particular aspect of my student is they are excellent, very good, they're, but they're all interested in teaching. So how to teach a uh, second language English, in, in this case, pronunciation. So I, right after I introduced this test to my students, they came up to me and they really wanted to, to think of how to use these tests for the purpose of pedagogy. So how to actually improve the, the situation in the classrooms. So then they impressed me with this uh, amazing research question. So let's use the auditory processing test to predict a profile match the L2 training methods. So people are different, benefiting differently benefiting from different types of in instruction. So this is called the aptitude treatment instruction. So we we may be able to find a students who can benefit more from certain type of uh, training. So I'm going to introduce the three MA students their projects. And the first one is the Yuji Shao. Uh, he, he actually published this paper in, in Tissot Quarterly. So what did he do? 
45, he recruited 45 Chinese EFL students and uh, he provided one week of choral repetition training by using an app. Hmm. This is a very typical thing that you can, you, know, you can typically see in EFL classrooms. So that the students were asked to, to listen to model sentences produced by native speakers by, by using up. So then they listen to the native speaker pronunciation model, then re repeat back. They can hear their own speech relative to native speaker model. So this is a core repetition, very typical uh, activity that uh, in EFL classrooms. And this is obviously production based because you're always prompted to produce it. And uh, obviously this is a form oriented rather than meaning oriented. <clears throat> And the findings, we have already known that this type of core repetition training is effective. So we, we saw significant improvement among students, but what's really interesting was that though, the learning gains were, uh, were actually also subject to individual variation. This individual variation was tied to the, uh, the integration abilities, but not the acuity. Mm. So, Let's move on to the next one. Uh, Ruyan Lin, uh, she conducted another uh, excellent study with the 42 Chinese EFL students. This time, she provided 1.5 hours of recast training on English uh, low, front, uh, low front vowel A. Ah. So this vowel doesn't exist in Chinese phonetic inventory. Therefore, Chinese learners of English, they have a difficulty in pro pronouncing this vowel. So basically, Ruyan let the students just freely talk, have you know, good conversations in English. But whenever they made errors on this particular vowel, ah, she jumped in and recast it. So this is how it goes. So I think it's a, it's a bed for children to read a, a Japanese anime. And then teacher jumped, so Ryan jumped in and she said, uh, a bad. So that, that's, the, that's the way how, how things happen. So this is a very famous thing that you can see from L1 acquisition literature, when the mothers see their babies making grammatical errors, that's the way how they kind of respond. And then, you can see this is a perception base, so you hear. And also this is a, a meaning oriented because the form uh, oriented episodes happen in the middle of the uh, conversation. And again, we already know that this type of training is actually effective for a, a, a L2 vowel acquisition. But what's really cool about this study was that the, uh, she also found that those who actually benefit more from request training had a better acuity, not the integration. And finally, uh, I want to introduce the Chao Kun's uh, um, uh, pay, uh, uh, project, 2021, uh, uh, published in Second Language Research. So she had a 50 Chinese MA students in London. So this time, her interest was actually those people who had been studying abroad in London for one year. And obviously, uh, so she did a cross-sectional analysis. So she checked their pronunciation. Obviously, the pronunciation was very different. Some of them really like native, like others still show a lot of you know, foreign accents. And then the findings. So the, uh, the, the incidence of advanced second language pronunciation proficiency among these particular participants was linked to both uh, acuity and integration. So uh, <clears throat> therefore, I, I want to kind of end this, this, this talk uh, by sharing our MA students and my team's tentative conclusion. So because now we are trying to just adapt this paradigm to the more like classroom context. Uh, if you find out your participants or students have a more precise acuity, this could hint at the possibility that they may excel in input-based training when they receive input training, like a recast training. Uh, next conclusion is the more, if you find out your students actually have a, a more precise integration, like the like drumming thing that you, you, you did. And this could indicate that you know, they may actually benefit more from output-based uh, uh, training. And finally, if you find out you have both acuity and also integration, then it's, it's, good, it's good for you to, to, to do something. <laughs> Just, <laughs> yeah, move, move right now. So that, that's the, maybe that's not the message, but anyway, so uh, that's it. So uh, thanks to the uh, funders. Uh, uh, that made all this project happen. And then thank you so much. And I'm very much excited to take on any uh, questions. And yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any, any questions? <laughs> oh, yeah, Andrea.
<laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, yeah, uh, important question, e ethically important question. Yeah, you know, yeah, sure. And <laughs> I don't know if I should repeat for the YouTube audience, but basically, Professor Andrea Rivers said that uh, what if you don't have anything? <laughs> if, if you don't have equity, if you don't have any integration, my message is that. Uh, don't be discouraged. And uh, uh, research, research has, sorry, I, I mean, I, I, I shouldn't be joking actually. So uh, research has shown the, the most important message coming from L2 phonetics research is that uh, you can be intelligible and comprehensible and a functional user as long as you use the language. So no problem, yeah, don't be discouraged. But it's just that if you have such talent, it will just make you slightly more advantageous than others. Yeah, so I hope I answered that question. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, th that's also really true. So uh, one another good news about this ability is that uh, we can train this. Uh, so uh, yeah. Th thanks. Th thanks, Oscar. Yeah. Let me come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> Professor Andrea Rivers still has some <laughs> follow-up follow -up question for me. Yeah. Yeah, uh, actually, the uh, if you, uh, the we, our team has has, has published a lot, uh, several papers on this topic, and uh, it's, it's it's really complicated, basically. So, if you if, let's say you keep getting answers right, correct, 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 and suddenly incorrect, and then then basically the, the your 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 uh, difficulty level will go back so it becomes easier and uh, you try again yeah and then uh, basically based on this type of like a so-called staircase procedure uh, they'll find out sorry yeah i, I i'm not able to sort of like uh, uh, explain this very well i mean even i forget about <laughs> precisely how this works but it's, it's it's a really good good test so if, if you're interested yeah please uh, uh check the some publications thanks but 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 sorry though, just to follow up, that's precisely the reason why this test can be done very quickly, because other because other researchers actually use like a you know hundreds of samples so that everybody will listen to the exact same you know the stimuli and then they'll find out how, how much they, they can go. But that takes forever. So that's the reason why this pro like staircase procedure is very cool. So then finding tuning to to, to precisely where you can maximally go. So mm. th thank you, thank you, Andrew. Oh, uh, thank you very much for your very mm. interesting presentation and important area of research. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about equity and mm -hmm. uh, skills that mm -hmm. they develop, they lend themselves to train. Mm -hmm. Do you have any evidence which one may develop faster or easier? Ah, uh, no, that's a that's a really good question, actually. The, the speed of improvement. Uh, that's an excellent question. And uh, I can see my MA students right there. So this, this could be a very good dissertation about that topic, I think, yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, audience, I was asked uh, if, if, if there's any difference in, in terms of the speed of improvement when they uh, receive the uh, uh, output-based and input-based as part of their auditory process, different auditory processing profiles. I feel like I'm a PhD student at Viva. <laughs> I, need to make, I need to make sure I have understood this, the question correctly. Okay, anyway, yeah. Uh, I had a question. You, you mentioned study abroad. I think everybody should benefit from the study abroad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was wondering whether there are any longitudinal studies. Oh, yeah, excellent question. Who weren't specifically trained on integration and equity, but, but, but that you followed over a period of time to see whether they evolve in the same patterns or not. Yeah, thank you so much, Jean Marc. I, uh, so, uh, uh, let me show you something very interesting to everyone. Uh, so we, so we actually may assume that the, oh, a study abroad would be you know panacea, you know, like it's a magical tool everybody can improve. And uh, uh, as you can, so we 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 our team tracked the thirty Chinese international students here at IOE over one year. And we assume that everybody's pronunciation will become better, but that's not necessarily the case. So uh, this y-axis is how much they improve in terms of the pronunciation. Yeah. And then uh, uh, what I want to point out is the, uh, uh, you know, many 
uh, improved, but others actually showed little improvement or you know, some, some participants even got worse. So, and then uh, x-axis, as you can easily imagine, what, why, and it looks like uh, the individual variation is tied to the uh, auditory processing. So uh, to, to me, coming back to what the Oscar said, this is a crucial issue because the, uh, uh, you know, they want to improve. They, they have invested a lot of money and time on, on this. And uh, we, we know that digital processing actually matters, but if you, this is a very controversial thing, but if you don't reach certain threshold, even though you're exposed to an amazing environment, immersion, you may not take the most advantage of that. And one another thing, what, which is really uh, interesting is that the, uh, I, I see the recast training or uh, output-based training, but not that many, but some studies have also shown that the certain participants didn't benefit from, from that type of instruction anyway. And the research has kind of hinted that, that it's related to the auditory, I shouldn't say deficit, but the relatively low level of auditory precision. So, so it's, it's really, interesting to, to, to think about it because that's also up to treatment interaction. If you actually have a slightly lower auditory pro processing, does that mean that you should go straight to the immersion settings or should you, know, should you do something else to, to get ready? Or as Oscar pointed out, training. We could actually train the auditory processing too. So yeah, that's, a, that's one kind of controversial direction, but yeah. I, don't know. I was wondering, so that's, I can see the explanation why certain people didn't improve mm -hmm. after, after the, after the year. Uh, mentioned, but what was the explanation to the people who didn't work actually? Is that more of a test? Uh, or is it? Yeah, that, so, so first of all, obvious, one obvious reason was that the, uh, those students probably did not practice. They did not use English that often. That's one thing. So that explained that a lot in terms of how far, why they didn't actually improve. But uh, even after we partialed out how much they were actually using a second language English over the course of one year, we still find a very strong relationship between the auditory processing and the, uh, their improvement patterns. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it seems to be the, it's, it's explaining something. Did you interview the bottom candidates? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. YouTube audience. Basically, people are now discussing why these Ch Chinese international students, even after one year of immersion, some people got stuck. And then uh, John Mark is suggesting I should have done the interview with <laughs> with with these participants. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So yeah. That, that the one thing, as I said, one thing that I I already know is that the, these participants were not that a motivated user of second language English throughout, yeah. But then obviously we collected that data, therefore we could, we were able to partial out in statistical analysis. Then, yeah, but, as, but uh, this is something that I kind of like a sense after years of the research in second language speech that, because I, I used to be interested only in experience. I thought that the, if you practice second language, you know, as much as you can, you, you should always improve a lot. And that's what I thought, but then you can still see a lot of individual variation. And then th this time, I mean, there are so many other factors, but one of them could be, uh, yeah, Ellie. I was just wondering perhaps about this study, whether you considered, whether you got information about their, about their interaction with the quality and quality of engagement. Engagement, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we did check. Yeah, so, so basically, I think, yeah, thanks a lot for the, the question. Yeah, we, we, we did check. But one good thing about this particular group was that uh, they're relatively still homogeneous. Yeah, they're all, the, you know, our students, <laughs> MA students at IOE. So they, they showed some similar in interaction patterns. But at the very same time, still within this group, we could see some variation. But this variation didn't seem to explain a lot of why this was happening. And also another uh, methodological point is that uh, it's also in the end difficult to track exactly how they're networking with uh, other users of second, uh, you know, other users of English. Like, 
yeah, maybe at the beginning of the immersion, they are so excited and they wanted to use English every day, you know, say hi and to everyone. But at the end of the study, I don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. Oh. Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, Bruce, okay. You can chip in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, we, we, we collected the pronunciation data, like uh, three or four data points. So at the very beginning, midpoint, and end of the study abroad. Yeah, right after they arrived, and then three months or four months later, or something like that, or maybe six months later, and then uh, at the very end, so one year. Yeah. So. Oh, please. Yeah. And maybe you can cite too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah. Maybe we can talk about this later. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, that, that, that's also true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, <laughs> okay. So basically, the, uh, how, again, how, how much they, they were using uh, uh, first language Chinese on a daily basis, this could be a confounding variable for this type of study. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, one time ago, I wondered about the area in which they came from also affected the values. Ah, uh, uh, do you think? I see. Right. I see. Thank you so much. Actually, that's a very good question uh, because uh, so basically I, I was asked about the uh, the uh, regions of these these participants in China. Where where did they actually come from? And this that variable may have affected the uh, the individual variation that we, we found here. And um, it's uh, it's it's a good point because the uh, Chinese. I mean, probably I should say that uh, it's also very important to talk about the nationalities of the participants. So th this time we're talking about the, uh, the, uh, the, where they came, the, what all these Chinese stu students came from. But uh, when we do this type of research, one other important thing is the where, where they're actually from. So tonal languages versus non-tonal languages, you know, that, that definitely affects the auditory processing. And also today I was talking about the two-way auditory processing model. So if you stick to the, uh, for example, pitch, and uh, acuity or integration, then this like, pitch is of course relevant to the ch Chinese. Therefore, they're extremely good at it anyway. Yeah, so we actually don't find that amount of indiv individual variation among Chinese speakers. So uh, that's a slightly different topic, but the auditory processing itself is also very different. Mm. Even us adults and coming from different parts of the world, depending on your first language. So that's, that, that's something that uh, we, we, if you want to use this auditory processing test for your research, one important factor is the uh, where your participants are from. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's, that's a good question. Yep, go, go ahead. Mm. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, that's the uh, my, my most favorite topic, actually, <laughs> rather, rather than aptitude, by the way. So, uh, yeah, there are so many different ways to define what it's, you, you mean by a good pronunciation or improvements. And uh, um, we collected so many different things, but uh, the, 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 this finding was based on something very simple. We ask participants to to talk about something like a ca casually, you know, spontaneously, and we collected a free speech from three or four different time points throughout the study abroad, and we asked the linguistically trained uh, uh, coders, uh, I mean the listeners, to listen to these speech samples and make a judgments in terms of segmental accuracy, and word stress accuracy, intonation accuracy, and the speed. 
Mm. And the, this result is actually the uh, 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 this derived from the overall. So uh, we just average across. Yeah, and then the, or we could also we could have used the acoustic analysis and so many different uh, instruments can be available. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, make sure. Uh, <laughs> Secret. <laughs> no, 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 of course not. No, no. Actually, that what what Oscar was saying is exactly what we are interested in. So. Uh, we're very much interested in the uh, plasticity of auditory processing. So even after you, you know, um, you pass the puberty, like is it still flexible? And the answer, we hope the answer is 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 yes. And then, uh, yeah, and also, also, also what's more interesting is actually the combination of both: combination of auditory processing training plus language training. So it's, so basically, sort of adding some small components called auditory training to the beginning of uh, you know, your language training that may help certain students with a certain auditory threshold, at least make the most of the experience. Uh, that's, that's, that's one thing that uh, uh, we are interested in. But also it's, it's definitely up to my students because they come up with a, a lot of great creative ideas. So yeah, yeah, sure. Have you ever considered looking at changes in the L1? I might say that the most important uh, Chinese president in the UK mm -hmm. who doesn't use Chinese very much may start to a tribe, and I would, I would be interested in, in knowing where that would happen and how it would emerge. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Yeah, uh, yeah the, the, as John was talking about the attrition effects, so if you have been in a second language speaking environment for a long time, obviously your L1 behaviors are changing. Uh, and uh, the first thing that you can notice is the grammar vocabulary. And uh, actually there, there is a research showing that the pronunciation in, in terms of this lower level linguistic skills are of course uh, are changing depending on how far, how, how much you're spending time in the second language speaking environments. And uh, what was I gonna say? Uh, yeah. And uh, also auditory processing patterns are uh, uh, changing as well. Not me, but uh, the uh, uh, other team members have found out that uh, uh, Chinese people, w when they, before coming to the U UK, uh, they're just so, prior, they're so fine-tuned to the pitch because that, that's, the, that's the acoustic inf information they use every single day. So when they listen to music, when they obviously listen to any kind of audio information, the pitch is, is, is always being activated. But uh, when they come to the U UK, spending a six months or so, then their Q weighting has shifted. So you, you basically sense, you know, sensitivity to pitch has slowly gradually declined and paying more attention to the other cues, like duration and uh, also the, uh, uh, the uh, volume, so the uh, intensity, yeah. So, so not only the language levels, but also auditory processing levels that's happening. So that's, that also gives me hope that, the, oh, okay, so auditory processing is that flexible, then we should be able to, to change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah, I think other members are working on that. So yeah, that's that's a that's a interesting topic. But uh, but in, in a way, language audio processing these things are actually quite a dynamic. I'm not hundred percent sure about other cognitive abilities though, working memory, attentional control. I don't know how much they're actually flexible and uh, easy to change. Uh, but maybe audience can give me a input. Okay. Yeah, time is up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now let's move on to the uh, next presenter. Cheers. Okay. Everyone, so uh, I'm very much honored to introduce my ELSWAF colleague, Professor Pravani Tavakoli, 
Uh, Parvani uh, currently teaches as a full professor at the University of Reading. Her main research interests lie in the interface between SLA, L2 testing, and uh, L2 teaching. And her, her, uh, her work regularly appears in top tier journals such as language learning, SSLA, to name a few. And there's so many uh, amazing things about uh, Parvani, but uh, one particular reason why I respect her as a role model researcher is, is that she always prioritizes the teacher's perspectives. And uh, she publishes work on the project for teachers. So today we are very lucky to hear and learn about Parvani's latest project on task complexity and interestingly, novice uh, pre-service teacher's perspective. So please uh, give her a big welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kazuya, for your very uh, nice and generous uh, introduction. Um, today I'm presenting uh, work in progress that my colleague Farah Nazvaez and I have done. And it's interesting to see that this is the second talk uh, collaborative work between uh, a university in the UK and Western University in Canada. Uh, to give you a background to the talk, uh, task difficulty and task complexity are two crucially important constructs in task-based language teaching, task-based language research, uh, and task-based language assessment. Uh, these two constructs are particularly important uh, because it is assumed that um, characteristics of a task affect language performance and can help drive language development forward. In other words, by manipulating um, certain characteristics, we can facilitate second language acquisition. From a language pedagogy perspective, this is a very important topic because we believe that second language teaching should aim towards facilitating uh, language learning. Um, and therefore, characteristics of tasks seem to be very important for both teaching and assessment. And in teaching, different areas would benefit from this, for example, syllabus design. The two um, constructs that I just referred to, task complexity and task difficulty, are used quite differently in the field, uh, with some people using them in very distinct senses, whereas others may use them interchangeably. Generally speaking, I come back to this later on to, about the distinction of these two constructs, but to give you a background, Task complexity is generally considered about the challenges and demands a task may have when you put the learner outside this. So you talk about the complexity of the task without particularly looking into the learner's perspective or the teacher's perspective. Whereas task difficulty you more or less looks at the perceptions of task difficulty from learners or teachers. Uh, for apart from the sections that I focus on models of task complexity and I tease out the differences between complexity and difficulty, for the rest of the talk, I would use these terms interchangeably. Um, again, to give you a background, the topic of task difficulty has been an important topic in task based language teaching for reasons of grading and sequencing tasks in language teaching. There has been a lot of interest in earlier research during the 1980s and uh, 70s and 80s from different researchers. The, a summary of um, what affects task difficulty is provided in the relevant literature, but they suggested uh, characteristics such as the linguistic complexity of the input, the amount of input, the challenge involved in performing a task as indicators of task difficulty. This interest was sort of faded away for a period of time, but then in the uh, 2000s, more researchers joined and investigated task difficulty. And you can see more re recent research from my colleagues, Andrea Revesh in this room and 
my other colleagues, Per Fontaine, even Per Fontaine and Judith Cormus in 2015. These studies have taken three different approaches to investigating task difficulty. Um, a number of studies have looked into empirical aspects, operationalizing task difficulty or manipulating task difficulty. But other studies have focused on what learners can see, consider as difficult and what teachers consider as difficult. Recently, Elise et al. in their work 2019 clearly suggested that the grading and sequencing tasks remain a major challenge in task-based language teaching. So there has been some research, but that research has not been conclusive and that research is not enough. So they are clearly indicating the need for future research. And they say perhaps the best can, that can be done is that take some concepts from these uh, research findings, but teachers should use their intuitions and experiences in order to guide their choice of the task in their syllabus. So in other words, they are reflecting or highlighting the need for knowing more about teachers' intuitions and experiences. Peter Skian in his work in 2018 also suggests that we need a system, we need a model, we need a framework in which we can start working on tasks, analyzing them, comparing them, and if possible at all, providing a set of principles according to which we can sequence and order the tasks. So, um, we have two models of task difficulty in the field of task-based language teaching. These two models have a lot of similarities and some differences. Uh, a, a key similarity is that they're both based in cognitive approaches to uh, language teaching and learning. So they draw on similar um, uh, principles, but they, they consider somehow different assumptions also, they have different predictions about what performance you can expect when you manipulate task complexity. For reasons of scope, I'm not going to focus on their predictions of performance or what impact task complexity might have on performance for the purpose of this talk. Um, I start with the first model proposed by Skin, limited attentional capacity. This model presumes that attentional resources and working memory are limited, but these limitations, attentional limitations, are only a constraint rather than inevitability. In this model, Skins uh, proposes that uh, task um, complexity should be viewed from different categories of cognitive complexity, code complexity, and communicative stress. In cognitive complexity, we could have cognitive processing that refers to the online processing, the challenges involved in online processing of information, and cognitive familiarity that um, allows or limits someone um, from access to pre-packaged and formulaic solutions that they can have for um, performing a task, when performing a task. Code complexity refers to linguistic um, challenges and demands, and communicative stress refers to um, the kind of characteristics related to the conditions under which one performs a task that might have an impact the communicative pressure, the number of participants involved, the number of elements uh, of things expected to do. Uh, Peter Skian also provides a list of principles that should be considered when looking into um, uh, task complexity. And um, it starts from uh, limitations of working memory and attentional, limit, uh, attentional resources being limited. But the last principle that he mentions is important to this talk because he suggests that task difficulty needs to be 
analyzed according to the two stages of speech production in Label's model, conceptualizer and formulator. And if you remember, Andrea was referring to this model before. I will show you a, sum a summary of the stages of Label's model later on when I connect our work with it. The other model of uh, task complexity that has been quite dominant in the field is Robinson's cognition hypothesis. Um, unlike um, Skian, Robinson believes attentional resources are not limited in the way Skian presumes them. He believes there are different pools of attention available to learners and therefore performing a task, they can resort to these different pools of attention. He defines complexity, task complexity in terms of task complexity, task difficulty, and task condition. So task complexity basically refers to, in, in Robinson's mother, refers to the cognitive challenges involved. Um, task difficulty refers to learners' perspectives and the individual differences between learners. And task condition refers to the conditions under which tasks are referred. Um, the distinction between resource um, directing and resource dispersing uh, factors are also important because he suggests that resource directing variables direct our resources and encourage speakers to perform their best possible performance, whereas resource dispersing variables can help to disperse the resources and can be a, a very useful source. Before moving on to show you the study, I want to make this point that the purpose of our study was not to see whether our findings fit in with either of these uh, models. And when we collected the data and analyzed the data, we were not trying at all to fit our findings into these two models. But as you can see, the kind of early conclusions that we arrive at is that parts of our work may fit within one of these two models. So the study I'm presenting here is only part of a larger project that we um, have been involved in. Uh, the main aim of the project was to get, uh, to develop a better understanding of early um, career teachers, um, pre-service teachers, perceptions of task, how do they perceive a task and how do they perceive task difficulty? And also we wanted to see how training can change them. But the data that you see here is just at the beginning of the study. So whatever the teachers say here is before they have received any training. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on one research question, and that is what criteria do pre-service English language teachers consider when analyzing task difficulty. The participants are 120 pre-service teachers of English enrolled on an MA TESOL course in a university in Canada. The course was two years and these students were on their final term of uh, their course. Uh, it was an international cohort, but the majority were Chinese L1 speakers and their proficiency level was B2, C1. Uh, we had a questionnaire, open-ended and close-ended questions, um, different format of questions involved, investigating the conceptualizations of the construct of task, task difficulty, demographic information. But again, the research question here today only focuses on their analysis of task difficulty which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, the data analysis we have taken, we have adopted a bottom-up uh, bottom approach to analyzing our data. And we have taken a content, a content analysis approach, looking for themes and sub-themes and the frequencies. This is the section relevant to task difficulty. We gave them two sets of tasks and we asked them to decide number one, which task was the most difficult, and number two, why they found this task most difficult. We also give them a description of the learners, who the learners were. 
because we thought it would give them a, a bit more um, feeling of being authentic about what they were doing. So a bit of background, some instructions, and these are the first set of the three tasks. The choice of task was determined by, uh, by a number of factors, you know, including familiarity of uh, the teachers with these things. Um, they were all speaking tasks and we wanted to tap into a wide range of tasks because we wanted to get as many uh, reasons for task difficulty as possible. But obviously you could include any other tasks here. This was the first set of the three tasks, and then we had the second set of the three tasks, section B. And these are the three tasks in the second part. So the uh, data analysis, we have analyzed only data from 25 participants. As I said, this work in progress. So we have got 50 sets of answers. Um, any key information that the students pro provided, we put it into an Excel sheet. Uh, we didn't give them any limitations. They could provide as many reasons as they could, but majority of students, majority of teachers provided three reasons. The range was between two and five. So we ended up in um, a data set. We analyzed small samples and it was a very time consuming and labor intensive process to get to this stage. We hope it is easier from now on. We met every week, we spent hours to analyze the data and what you see is 100% agreement. So 143 key pieces of information, uh, 138 of them have been coded. There were five piece, pieces of information we couldn't really understand. And we wish we had uh, retrospective interviews with the learners. Six broad categories uh, came up, linguistic demands, cognitive operational demands, task informational demands, task design general, learner background, and communicative demand. And the numbers you see is the frequency of referring to such uh, main, th main themes within the data. So to show it uh, to you visually, as you can see, the frequencies are considered here. So the linguistic demand was the highest uh, frequently mentioned theme to communicative demands, which was only mentioned six times, surprisingly. So I'm going to give you examples from the data and the subcategories that emerged. So for example, linguistic demands, familiarity with discourse or genre, vocabulary, grammar, output demands, or specific skills or language. You can see that reference to output demands or specific language skills or generally reference to the language requirement was the most frequent sub theme. Cognitive operational demands, we were very surprised to see how many references these teachers made to the cognitive operational demands. It was really surprising for us, but you can see, um, Reasoning was the most frequently mentioned sub-theme, but organization of thought, idea generation, the need for decision-making, they were all important sub-themes. Task informational demands. So whether the information provided in the task was clear and sufficient, amount of information provided in the task, was it um, enough and understandable, close-endedness, open-endedness, and task familiarity, whether they were familiar with content and processes. So task design general, these are things that refer to when they consider the tasks sort of in isolation, 
when they separated it from other uh, things that they were discussed before. Interestingly, they refer to taskness. You know, this is not something they do in their real life. So therefore, this must be not very easy for them. Learner background, they refer to issues such as, you know, levels of proficiency. And, you know, the data suggested that this is not linguistic demand. We don't want to call this linguistic demand. This is generally the level of proficiency and communicative demands. So to sum up, uh, we, have, we have results that can take us further to um, the existing models. You know, we, we can see some synergy between our findings and what Skian suggests. So for example, code complexity relates to our linguistic demands. Skian's cognitive complexity also relates to our work in cognitive operational demands and task informational demands. It was interesting to see that communicative stress, what Skian calls communicative stress, relates to both task design general factors for us. So for example, how many, um, what Skian calls scales or how many elements, how many um, different things to do are there is considered communicative stress in Skian's model. Our learner, our teachers refer to that as features of task design. Um, and learner background that is not available in uh, um, Skian's model seem to be um, something that our teachers were considering. Uh, Skian has asked um, the research researchers in this area to link um, task difficulty to Leibold's model. As Andrea said, Leibold's model includes three stages of conceptualization, formulation, and articulation. Conceptualizer um, in charge of generating preverbal message, formulator in charge of putting the message into language. And this has given us some food for thought to see how we can link our work to um, these areas of speech production. Skian himself has done um, a, a kind of planning, sketching um, his model of task difficulty to um, Leibold's model of speech production. And what I can say is that this is work in progress. We can't really give a finalized idea of where our um, schemes would link to conceptualize it, but easily it is perceived that cognitive operational demands and task informational demands link to conceptualizer uh, and communicative demands and linguistic demands link to formulator. But I can see communicative demands can affect conceptualizer as well. And probably learner factors can also affect a conceptualizer. So as I said, this is food for thought for us. What we're doing next is uh, limitations of the study. As I said, you may think, why didn't we do uh, interviews? Um, unfortunately, we didn't do retrospective interviews with the teachers to ask for elaboration for their work. Also, a, a limitation of our study is that these are pre-service teachers. We wish we had also, maybe this is next study, some more experienced teachers. We have more data to analyze, and it is likely that more themes would emerge. We need to examine the data quantitatively to see which task receives the highest ranking of difficulty. And then we would like to see how our teachers responded to our training in this area. So at this stage, I would like to stop and to thank you very much for listening to this talk before lunch. <laughs> Questions, Jean-Marc and then Andrea. Jean-Marc. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, um, Agane. That was a, a really interesting uh, part of, of the ongoing research. 
Um, I have one question about uh, people's being, um, in fact, mentioning only one um, negative emotion that may have an effect on the formulation. Um, I was wondering whether there might not also be a positive emotion that would in fact not affect any of these components, but that would have a broader effect on uh, the, the, the participants' willingness to engage in, in the path. Absolutely. So, and, and specifically then links to, um, you know, is, is this balanced, um, is, is there enough challenge? Do I have the skills? Is this some, this is something that I might find enjoyable. If it's too challenging or, or, or too easy, I, I, I don't really care. Absolutely. I won't even start conceptualizing and the whole thing kind of collapses. Absolutely. I think um, I can't say um, in confidence, but I believe the examples that Peter provides for his communicative stress are just examples. So anxiety is only an example of things that can affect. Um, I'm sure there are other things. And in our data, there were mentions of, you know, oh, this is interesting, or this is not interesting, or, you know, students would feel petrified when um, they're asked to um, engage in the role play for the interview. So, yes, I'm sure emotions and engagement, you know. I also believe, as I suggested, that these such learner variables would probably have an indirect impact on what we do in our conceptualization. And yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, I totally agree with you. You know, I think anyone in this room. So the question is how teacher these teachers are or whether they are. I think I, I consider myself, um, Andrea, a language learner still. Uh, you know, English is not my native language. I have been teaching English for 35 years. Don't ask me how old I am. <laughs> Uh, I've been teaching English for 35 years, 22 of which is in Britain, and I still consider myself as a learner. So my answer is yes. As I said, they were B2, C1 level. And I think these are the kind of students that we have in the UK on our MA programs. The only difference is that their program is longer and the, these students have been there for a longer period of time and the cohort was similar to ours a majority chinese speakers but there were others in terms of the training uh, andrea the module they were taking was supposed to introduce them to task-based language teaching so at this stage they don't know much about task unless they have been keen and they have done their studies. But what you see hopefully in future after this is whether they responded to the training that they received. Yes. Absolutely. You know, this is something that we wouldn't know, but we hope that the instruction over a year and a half have sort, sort of helped them get a more current perspective to language learning and teaching, but we have no evidence for that. And as I said, without another study in which we can look into more experienced teachers in different contexts, probably this would be only a limited model of task difficulty. Some kind of research, as we do in uh, pedagogical techniques, 
if it's working, if it's not the same, but the teacher thing. Is it anything you could do? I, I'm not aware of this kind of research, but listening to your talk, I realized that would be very much needed. Uh, the question, thank you very much. The question is, um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the question is, uh, would it be possible to deliver such kind of training, TBLT training for teachers on teacher training programs? Yes, not, not only that, but also to measure how effective that is. Okay, to measure effectiveness of the training. I think, you know, I, my uh, specialism is not teacher education. However, I'm familiar with um, uh, research that reports effectiveness of teacher training. I think uh, the best uh, example that I can remember, my colleagues, Rosemary um, Erlam and Rod Ellis in New Zealand, they have done a national project of training um, teachers on uh, TBLT, perhaps um, a, a selective approach to TBLT, because TBLT is quite wide ranging, and they are reporting positive benefits. Okay. All right. Yes. And then, Victoria, I come back to you. We, uh, so the question is, how much do we know about the teacher's linguistic background themselves? Um, they, as I said, they were B2C1 when they started their course in Canada, and they have lived in Canada for a minimum of 18 months. So we expect that they are at least B2C1, if not better. Uh, in a piece of research that I did back in 2009, I investigated teachers' perceptions of task difficulty in London, and these were experienced teachers, and all of them were native speakers of English, and interestingly, linguistic demand was again in the top categories. So linguistic demand seems to be quite important to teachers. I, I can't say anything about that, but the example that I gave you suggests that regardless of how you as a teacher, uh, how, how fluent, how proficient you are, you always worried about your learners' uh, proficiency, uh, linguistic demands that the task may impose on them. Victoria, and then I have another question. Victoria. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. So very good question, Victoria. To, you are trying to tease out whether what researchers see as complexity, teachers see as complexity as well. Um, you know, this wasn't the aim of this project, but again, based on the work that I have done so far, I can see overlaps, definite overlaps between what teachers see as complex and um, researchers see. But there is outside this overlap, there is also areas that teachers are worried about. Again, referring to the study that I did in 2009, teachers were worried about issues such as cultural appropriateness. And in that study, I had also investigated learners, exactly the same learners, and they didn't have even a mention of, oh, this is not culturally um, suitable. So we can, we can expect variance. 
You have a question, you said? Yes. Yeah. Um, um, I was just interested in the analysis of data. I don't know um, if you used um, all the post-it notes that you showed. <laughs> no, that was a photo yeah, from, yeah. from Google. So, uh, and it would be probably too, we don't have much time uh, now, but um, could you have, did you use Envivo? No, we didn't use Envivo um, because I think we wanted to have a good um, operationalization of what we thought was task difficulty. Uh, what we did, we started with five participants' data, and I think we sat on the five participant data for four or five meetings. Um, and we had a, a very long discussion about many some points were very clear you for example if the teacher said um they have to make reasoning here that was clear but if they said oh i think language proficiency is an issue here we need to sit and read the context again and again um so there were pieces of data that we had to have a discussion about for half an hour and there were parts of the data that were easier to um, to work with. So we didn't really find Envivo useful for this purpose. Um, but I think we have reached a, a stage that from now on, uh, analyzing data would be easier. A very time consuming if anyone wants to do that kind of. <laughs> yes, very, very time consuming. Okay, if you have no questions, I think everyone should be very much looking forward to the lunch break. Thank you very much.
quite sure. Yeah. Let me, let me quickly uh, share. <laughs> This is the yeah. And I just see there's a word missing in the title. That's right. Is that right? There's a word missing. Oh, we can fix it, right? Can I? Very yeah, quick. Of course, of course. Yeah. You know, the amount of times you look at something. Absolutely. You get used to it and then you don't see it. This happens very much in your home. You know, the day you move to a new home. You just get used to it. You don't see anything. Where's the camera? Oh, oh, but that there's a one minute delay there. I was like, I'm not there. <laughs> yeah, this is what we're doing. Actually, two minutes of delay. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Working right now. Is this is this work? Hello, hello. Is this working? It's working. Is it working? Yes. Perfect. For the for the audience in this room. This one is for the YouTube. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the afternoon session of our colloquium. Uh, I am very pleased to introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Eloy Puch-Mayenko from uh, King's College London. Um, Eloy currently holds uh, a lecturer position in applied linguistics at King's College London. Um, he completed his PhD in psycholinguistics at the University of Reading. And following from that, uh, he, pulled, he held um, an ESRC postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Southampton. Uh, his main research interests include uh, issues related to bilingualism, multilingualism, and psycholinguistics. And he has published his work in top journals in the field. I'm very, very pleased that he is uh, delivering his talk here today. And the title, as you can see, is Assessing the Validity of the Later. Please join me in welcoming Eloy to this colloquium. Thank you, Parvani, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming back after lunch. I know perhaps it's not the best of the times, and we might be a bit of sleepy, sleepy but hopefully you all got coffee. Uh, so to, a bit of a disclaimer before I get started. What I'm presenting today is not the type of work that I would typically talk about in terms of uh, acquisition or some of the things I've done with Japanese, English, Spanish, trilinguals. But instead, I've decided to present this as a kind of methodological footnote something that I've been thinking about quite a bit since I did my PhD and a reviewer pointed out uh, in one of the reviews, and I'll discuss that in a second. Before that, I also want to acknowledge, of course, that this is not work I've done by myself. I need to acknowledge my collaborators. Adele Chao-Jorozko, who's at the Polytechnic University of Hong Kong, Hong Liu, who's a Xiaotong Liverpool University in Shanghai, and Fernando Martin Villena, who's a PhD student at Universidad de Granada. So this is work I've done with them. So what I want to do today is I want to explore how the Lextel has been used in, SLA, in the SLA literature. And I want to assess its validity, its validity as a measure of global, gen, or global L2 proficiency. I'll, and I will unpack that in a little bit. So I think that, and it goes without saying, that the role of proficiency in SLA has been central across paradigms, irrespective of what you're interested in. We all talk about proficiency. And perhaps we could do a very quick exercise and you could perhaps raise your hand if you've discussed or thought about the proficiency of your participants at some point in your studies. I certainly have, and perhaps most of you have, as I was kind of expecting. Some people have, however, been interested in understanding what proficiency means and operationalizing it, right? That's something that some people have done, just to name a few here. But some others, like myself, for example, have used the concept of proficiency to explain some of the variants or some of the things we see in our studies, or well, at least to make sure that our groups are comparable. So we've used proficiency as a kind of a factor in our 
studies, even if we're not interested in proficiency per se. And that's, in fact, what, I, what I've done, some of us have done, and what I want to explore today. So to date, there are four systematic reviews, at least to the best of my knowledge, that have examined how SLA researchers have operationalized the notion of proficiency in their studies. And that's for people who are not interested in proficiency per se, but using proficiency as a predictor in their work. And I just, uh, I've just screenshotted here a, a very nice table taken from Park et al. 2021, very recently published on language learning, that kind of summarizes the finding of the first three systematic reviews. The one by Thomas in 1994 did a, a systematic review of how people had used or operationalized proficiency. And what they did find is that out of the studies that they were reviewed, 157 in total, only 36.3% of those studies had actually used independent measures of proficiency proficiency in the studies. Thomas 26, I, 20, uh, 2006, a kind of follow-up study with similar methodology, found again a, a similar rate of operationalization of proficiency as an independent measure. We see that uh, they found a rates of 42.6% and with different uh, types of proficiency kind of measures. Tremblay 2011, in a kind of, again, a follow-up, not a direct follow-up, but a chronological follow-up, did a similar study, reviewed 144 studies, and found, again, a similar rate of operationalization of proficiency, 36.8%. Again, you can see different categories of proficiency or different measures of proficiency that were used. Park and colleagues in 2021 very recently followed up on these previous reviews and, and looked at what had been done in the last 10 years, from 2012 to 2019. And what they did find after examining 500 uh, studies in a systematic way was that 91.2% of studies reported L2 proficiency, which is quite indicative of the fact that we all talk about proficiency in our studies, right? Importantly, however, 25% uh, of these studies use, used multiple measures. For example, uh, some uh, used uh, one or more regional simplified sections of uh, existing standardized proficiency tests. Others used closed tests, oral tests, vocabulary tests, and other independent tests. So within the studies that actually talk about proficiency, there's quite a, a bit of variation as to the measures that are actually used. And then there were also some non-independent measures. What I do want to highlight is that out of these 91.2% of studies that use or talk about proficiency, only 42% of those use independent measures, objective, so-called objective measures, right? Which uh, already uh, gives us a lot of food for thought. And in a way, if we actually look at the four systematic reviews that, that in fact actually give us an overview since the 80s to 2012, we see that the story hasn't changed much, right? We're at around 40% of studies using an independent measure of proficiency. And again, as I want to further emphasize that within the independent measures that have been employed, there is quite a bit of variation. We, we've seen existing, existing standardized tests, closed tests, et cetera. In fact, in the four presentations that we saw this morning, I think that we had four different ways of operationalizing proficiency already, which again shows about the variability of methods that we do use. So I won't say the picture hasn't really changed much in, in the past 10 years. And in 2012, Lemhover and Brishma already said something that I, I quite like is, given the central role of proficiency in L2 research, it is alarming. And I want to emphasize the word alarming because I think that it is alarming how little consensus there is in how we measure it. Especially so if we're then going to take a step back and compare our own studies against each other. How do we know that what we're talking about is the same thing or that we have got participants within the same levels? And I think that that is quite important. Back then, with uh, the uh, Lemhover and Brishma proposed the Lextel as a measure of vocabulary knowledge. And that is important, right? Although, as we'll see in a second, uh, the Lextel has been used as a measure of global proficiency. That was not their, general, th their initial intention. The initial intention was to provide a measure of vocabulary knowledge of uh, le a lexical capacity and so on. And they already emphasized after their study that potentially, and they emphasized the word potentially, the Lextel could be a good measure of global proficiency in SLA studies. So what is the Lextel? I mean, uh, of course, please feel free to read the original paper where they explain everything or look at their website that you can access it and take it uh, yourself. But basically the, the Lextel is a yes, no lexical decision task. 
It consists of 60 items, 40 words and 20 non-words. Items are taken from an unpublished vocabulary size test called the uh, 10K from Yara 1996. And all items are between four and 12 letters long with mean of 7.3. And then there are the words that are uh, uh, spread across different categories and the non-words follow the phonotactics and orthographical conventions of English. And importantly, uh, as Lemhover uh, mentions in their original paper, they do not correspond to any Dutch or Korean words. And that's relevant because those are the L1s of their participants. We've checked for that and they do not correspond to Spanish or Chinese words either, which will be relevant for our study. You can see if you take the test yourself and certainly welcome you to encourage you all to do it. It takes, takes about three and a half minutes. So really quick, very convenient for SLA research. It gives you the introductions. You see a word, yes, no, and you do need to decide whether it is a word or not. And then depending on your scoring, you'll get a percentage of lexical knowledge, so to say. But I guess the question is, has the reliability of the lexile been explored as a measure of global proficiency? Well, the first study to do so was the one in which this was proposed. Van Hover and Brishma tested uh, 72 Dutch uh, speakers of English and 87 Korean speakers of English. They uh, focused on highly advanced uh, participants to make sure that the Dutch and Korean groups uh, were, had comparable proficiencies. They just included Korean speakers who had a 750 or above in the TOEIC score which if you are familiar with this test, that would be a C1 kind of C2 level of proficiency, so fairly advanced. They had five different measures. They did the Lextel, an L1 to L2 translation, an L2 to L1 translation, the Oxford Quick Placement Test as a kind of valid standardized measure of global proficiency. And then they also asked for their self ratings of English proficiency. And they looked at the correlations between these measures. Very briefly, the correlation between the Lextel that's what we're interested in. And the Oxford Quick Placement Test was uh, fairly high, uh, following the Pearson's uh, coefficient, correlation coefficient, 0.63, that's a fairly high correlation, indicating that for the Dutch participants, the Lextel did correlate nicely with the scores in the Oxford Quick Placement Test. For the L2 Korea, for the L1 Korean speakers, the correlation which was much lower, indicating that L1 had an effect and linguistic distance between the L1 and L2 did influence the correlation of the leg tail. Uh, they also presented some correlations between ratings and Oxford Quick Placement Test. And in fact, actually, the picture is better for self based so, so self rate, self mean self ratings of proficiency, whereby correlations were indeed actually higher for both groups. Notice we were at 70, 74 uh, uh, co coefficient for the Dutch speakers and for, uh, 40 for the Korean speakers. So perhaps the picture is not so bad for mean ratings, but I can, I can talk about that a bit later as well. Following up, Nakata and colleagues in 2020 published as well a study, a very similar study where they assessed the reliability of the Lexdale, and what they did was they tested 111 Japanese speakers. Uh, their TOEFL score was 502.90. That was the mean average score that would correspond to B1, B2 level. So the first indication of the, their proficiency being slightly lower in this study. Four different measures, Lexdale, translation task, vocabulary size test, and self ratings again. And what the results show for this group is a much lower correlation, similar to that of the Korean speakers in the first study, but very much lower than that of the Dutch participants. So again, I think that this is already telling us that linguistic distance will play a role and potentially actual proficiency might also. And we will get back to that. Again, the, cor the correlation for the self ratings was not the same. So that's a typo, it was slightly lower in this case. And I'll link my results back to, to these two studies later on. So now I get to what I've done. With, with, there are two parts moving on. There's a kind of systematic review of how the Lextel has been used to date in the past 10 years. And then an empirical study, a semi-replica of the Lenhover and Brishma study that I want to present. So the, the systematic review that we conducted was last updated in March 27, 2022. Uh, we did a search follow using Google Scholar, ab abstract ProQuest, connected papers, so on and so forth. We used keyboards like uh, keywords like Lextel and the actual citation, which gave us a total of 787, 787 studies, which were then coded by three very talented undergraduate students 
I would have not been able to go through every single study and code it myself, so they did, did help. You had a challenge, Lisa Loy and, and, and Julia as well. In terms of the coding procedure, what we did was we first coded for whether the leg cell had been only cited or actually used in the experimental design. We thought that that was important. We also coded for the, language, the L1 of the participants used in the study to see whether the, the type of uh, L1s that the leg cell had been used with the level of the participants in the study, we, we, we wanted to know whether been, it had been used with advanced learners or pre-advanced. And I use pre-advanced to just get the whole picture here from beginner to whatever pre-advanced means, right? And I'll just say something on that in a second. And then we had the target domain, whether they'd been looking at phonology, vocabulary, syntax, semantics, vocabulary acquisition, pragmatics, et cetera. And then whether they had actually found, whether a specific study had actually found an effect of proficiency or not. We'll focus on these three today. In terms of use, what you see is an explosion of use of the Lextail. You can see the number of times the Lextail has been cited within the past 10 years. Some of you might now be saying, well, hold on a second. You're, we're talking about citations. How about actual use? We, we see actually a parallel picture where there's simply an explosion of studies using the Lexel as a measure of global proficiency. I mean, I've got my, my intuitions of why that is the case, right? It's a very short and efficient way of using. I myself have used it. So it's just very convenient for all of us, right? But I think it's worrying to think that, all, that its reliability hasn't really been looked at. The languages that uh, have been used, the Lexia has been used with 31 different L1s, so quite a variety of languages. You've got the examples here, Arabic, Basque, Chinese, Dutch, so on and so forth. And crucially, however, the L1s are not equally distributed, right? What we do see is that the vast, there's almost 30% of studies that have used L1 Dutch, perhaps not surprisingly. Then we've got German, Chinese, Spanish, French, Portuguese, and then all the other languages, right? So we, there is a clear uh, bias towards Indo-European languages, perhaps with the exception of Chinese there, and then all others. But I guess that we need uh, much more studies here. In terms of the level, and that, that was surprising to me because the Lexel is not, the Lexel is designed for advanced learners uh, in the name of the test already explicitly mentioned, but the vast, the vast majority of studies that have used it actually use pre-advanced, at least one group of pre-advanced learners, right? What we do see is that 11% of the studies target for advanced participants only. To me, that's worry, worrisome, right? Because the Lexel was never designed for, for groups that are not advanced. But that just goes to say, if the, sometimes that we just take things for granted, I would say. And I think that for me, this was an exercise of taking a step back and say, hey, what am I using and how am I using it, right? And then there's 89% studies that contain at least one group of what I call pre-advanced learners. I operationalized it as, as to whether researchers had used different labels other than advanced and whether they had a, a score lower than 80% in the Lextel. So that's what we've got, what we know, how it's been used. Again, I want to say that the, the, the whole point of this study actually came after someone pointed out that I should have used the Lexel in one of my studies because it would have been more time efficient. I, I, I made my, the participants in my dissertation, I made them take the Oxford Quick Placement Test, which took them about 40 minutes, ultimately to say nothing about my, my study because they were all beginner learners, right? So they say, well, perhaps you could have used the Lextel. I was like, could I really? And that's what got me going with this. So uh, uh, the study entertains the following uh, interrelated questions. Is the Lextel a valid measure? Does linguistic uh, distance matter? And does level of proficiency matter, right? And they did a background questionnaire, the Lextel and the Oxford Quick Placement Test background questionnaire, we, we gathered all sorts of information, background information, information regarding their linguistic profile, their current studies, so on and so forth. We also asked for their self-rated self proficiency to explore whether that would actually tell us something. And then they did the Lextail, as we've seen already. And then they did the Oxford Quick Placement Test because it, it's a, a standardized test that's been tested over a thousand participants. It has multiple versions. We adapted the pen and paper one onto a web-based format that was done through Ibex Farm and Qualtrics. It's got 60 multiple choice question. 
and crucially, importantly for us, it's got a standardized scoring procedure against the CEFR that would allow us to actually classify our participants into whether they were advanced or intermediate le learners. We targeted two groups of participants, L1 Chinese, L2 English. We started off with 343 participants for the Chinese group, though I will only present data from 278 because we excluded beginners. I can tell you more about that if you want in the questions. And then we've got, L, we had L1 Spanish, L2 English speakers. Again, we started off with 279. We ended up including 242 participants. So very briefly, the results of the Oxford Quick Placement Test. So the first thing to say is that we used it to classify our participants into whether they were beginner or uh, intermediate or advanced. We use the standardized scoring procedure. And you can see here in the violin plot that they, of course, the, 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 the results are quite neat, but that's because this test was used to categorize them. We've got intermediate participants with lower proficiency than advanced participants, as we would expect. I'm going to report data from these four levels. Then we've got the results of the legs tail. And what we already see is that it shows much more variation across groups, right? Because we're using that categorization in the first task to examine the legs tail. And that already tells us that an intermediate participant could score at 100% accuracy in the legs tail. And we'll explore that further. So there does not seem to be a clear distinction for those in the intermediate group. And we'll explore this in a second. A very quick note on correlations. I know that most of you are familiar, but in case we've got students or people in the audience that are not, what I'll do is I'll present scatter plots on the x-axis. I'll always plot the Lexel score. In the y-axis, I'll plot the Oxford Quick Placement Test score. And what we will do is we'll interpret uh, the, the linear regression as a kind of positive correlation, negative correlation. And then we've got, that's how we'll interpret. We'll interpret Pearson's correlation coefficient as below 30 as a low, between 30 and 50 as moderate, and above 50 as high. And we'll do the, the we'll now look at the, Oops, sorry, something just came up here. So those are the results. In terms of the overall look, what we do see is that there is a moderate correlation between the Lex test score and the Oxford Quick Placement Test of 0.37 when we don't take into account L1 or proficiency, as you can see here. So there is a moderate correlation. When we look at the, the, the scores by L1, so with with orange, we've got the Spanish group, and in black, we've got the Chinese group. What we do see is that there is a slightly higher correlation of 0.40, but still moderate correlation, right? That's for the Chinese group. And in fact, contrary to our expectations, a lower correlation for the Spanish group. We've got a 0.27, so it's a low correlation where we see that for the Spanish group. When we look at the, result, the results by proficiency group, what we actually see Again, you see in red, you see the advanced participants. In blue here, uh, you would see the intermediate participants. What we do see is that the correlation for the intermediate participants is very low at 0.19, right? Indicating that it doesn't quite work with intermediate learners. And I'll, 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 I'm not surprised about this because it was never intended to do so, right? When we look at the advanced, the picture is not as nice as I was hoping it to be. It's at a 0.30 when we only look at advanced, which again, if we think of the results in Lemhover's study, that was at a 67, the correlation was a 0.67, right, for the Dutch participants, right? So here is actually quite low. So our results as a whole show that there is a moderate correlation for the L1 Chinese group, slightly higher for the L1 Korea, Korean participants in the Lemhover and Brishma study. There is a low correlation for the L1 Spanish group, much lower than the L1 Dutch participants in the same study, but Dutch and English are Germanic languages, Spanish isn't, perhaps that's it's telling us something about that. There is a stronger moderate correlation for in the advanced uh, participants and a low one for the intermediate participants, which provides further evidence for Nakata's and colleagues' explanations of the results that the Lexel does not quite work with intermediate learners. So, the leg tail in the original study was shown to be a very good predictor for vocabulary size, especially in advanced participants, and especially so for the Dutch participants, right? So we need to use the leg tail core score with caution when we infer things about general global proficiency. And I think that that's been the problem in the literature, that we've taken the leg to be something that was never meant to be. Especially so, and even more importantly, when we look at 
pre-advanced participants, right? Because the correlation was really low with intermediate learners. It's even lower and inexistent with beginner learners. I, I haven't presented the data, but we've explored that. So I guess some of you might be wondering, okay, so are you telling us not to use it? Well, no, right? Let's do whatever we think is best in our studies. We might want to use it if we want to guarantee that our groups are comparable, right? If we want to have, they've got the same vocabulary size, but then let's use them. We might want to use the, Lex, the score in the Lextel to create groups of participants who differ in vocabulary size. As Lem Hover proposes, perhaps we can create two groups and that might be, te be telling us something about our studies. Perhaps we might want to use the score to create two groups of participants differing in vocabulary size, which I've already said. Or perhaps uh, the, the third point should say, perhaps we want to use the, the Lextel as a kind of a screening tool to say, okay, we only want advanced participants. Let's first screen them with the leg tail and then let's test them on something else. If we need to talk about proficiency, perhaps we don't need to be talking about proficiency so much if it is not relevant for our own studies. So I guess the point or take home message of the presentation is let's just be careful with the tools we use and the terminology we use to talk about them. Yes, we may want to use the leg tail, but we need to know what the leg tail is telling. So I guess the next step is to explore the self-rating data, which I didn't have time to present, but shows perhaps a bit of a stronger correlation than the one for the Lextel. Perhaps the stigma we've got with self-ratings is unjustified based on some empirical data. And perhaps I'm saying something I shouldn't be saying, but I guess there is an empirical question ultimately. On that note, I just want to acknowledge the participants that were uh, from the Xi'an Jiatong University, uh, University of Liverpool in Shanghai, and Universidad de Granada, and some of the funding we got from King's College. And if people do have questions, uh, we'll very much appreciate that, especially so because we're now deciding whether we're going to write this up and whether it's worth for us to just put it out there. Uh, yeah, so feedback will be very much welcome. Thank you. Absolutely, especially if proficiency is, is not the main focus of our own study, right? Something that we're just using to control things. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, Paul. Okay, so I haven't explored those other measures, mostly because this is just a kind of first step into me questioning whether I should use it or not, right? But I'll certainly explore those. In fact, my idea, I guess, after having done this and finding it quite interesting to do it is, I'm tr in thinking of applying for a, a slightly bigger grant that would allow me to test multiple of these quick and dirty tests because we need to validate them across 
different L1s. So I'm thinking Arabic, Dutch, Chinese, Spanish, and other languages across uh, in a kind of macro kind of design. So I'll certainly look at those. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they look, um, yeah. Uh, if this is the same one I'm thinking of, I think that they very recently uh, published a paper discussing some of Paul Mira's work on, on these lexical decision, decision tasks. Yeah. But Vaniano? Yeah. Just uh, a comment on that. I think I've used the Wi-Fi a lot, and I think one of the differences sampling how, how the items are sampling in the design is uh, different and, and the lexical as you said is particularly uh, for advanced uh, learners where the, the wine lens is more uh, geared to nice so about my I was thinking I mean I, thank you very much for this course it's really nice it, and it's great that you're listening to these I've, I've, um, I've used these tests uh, as well and I've had those discussions myself I was wondering whether one of your conclusions would also be so you said that perhaps we could use the left tail in to differentiate uh, um, at, uh, among groups or we are looking when we are looking at vocabulary size <coughs> participants who I'm sure that they have a similar vocabulary size would you then say that we should only use it for advanced learners really even if our focus is vocabulary size or making decisions about vocabulary size because that's what it was intended or if you <laughs> do you <laughs> I, I, I guess one of one of my issues with this study is that it's not what I was expecting. I was only doing it to validate my own use of it. Right? Say, hey guys, we can use it and it will work. And I've used it shamefully. No, oh, I guess not shamefully with intermediate participants myself. So I guess after having explored that, I said, let's not use it with intermediate participants, even to screen, because it's some intermediate participants actually got quite high and some others quite low, right? So I don't think it's uh, a reliable measure for these participants. Perhaps we can explore other tests as you've both said. I guess it's an empirical question that, that we need to know. I guess for now, I'd say, let's not use it. Let's use the Lexa for what it was intended in the first place. And I think that that's been one of the problems that has worried me when I look at the literature after the systematic review is how are we also using it without even consider? I guess, I, well, I guess I don't know. My answer would be, oh, I don't want to commit perhaps, but yeah, thanks Anna. Yes, there are 60 items, 40 of which are words and 40 of which are non-words, and then presentation and then quick lexical decisions that yes, no, yes, no. Yes. Uh, I think so, yeah. No. I think it's a small number of non words. It's 20, 40, 20. And okay, but the option is yes, no. It, it's the yes, no option. But there are, there are more real yes, words. Yes, no than option. Yeah. So, for example, if we carry on making yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You I, 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 Anna might want also, to say. Also, because I think that then the, the score is adjusted yes, because it exactly. uh, falls alarm rate, right, yeah. Yes, yeah. So then there is a formula applied to the final score. Yeah. Adjusting. I mean, but yeah, there is. Yeah, there is some adjustment, as Anna said. Yeah. And you know, in a way, I, I am a researcher myself, and I totally understand the urgency is up in having some kind of nice formula that you can use and you can use it 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 yeah, <laughs> I might use that that as to in the paper. <laughs> Perhaps not so cool.
of the urgency of the social class, which is fine, but at the same time, one of the aspects of change that really helps us to get into the living And perhaps I would add that perhaps we don't all need a measure of proficiency, though reviewers and we all tend to ask for this, right? So, for example, in my work, my dissertation work and the work I'm doing at, with app initial learners, right? I, I know their level of proficiency is low. Other things like L engagement with the L3 exposure might matter more than, than proficiency per se. And yet, every time someone says, like, did you test their proficiency? Like, they've had. 50 hours of exposure, their proficiency will be low, right? I, I know that, but I don't have an independent measure. So perhaps it's about this bias in the field that we keep asking each other. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Either the thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh -oh. uh -oh. <laughs> Hundred percent agree. And Absolutely. No, 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 absolutely. I, I, and I agree with everything you've said, the, the, the complexity of it. And that, and in fact, the the study with by Lemhover and Brishma actually shows, doesn't show a nice correlation between the, the Oxford quick placement test and TOEFL scores either, right? Indicating, and I think that they already say that in the paper, perhaps these two tests are measuring different things. So, uh, and yeah, I guess, yeah, thanks. I agree, yes, because we- Very quick point. First of all, this is a very great study. You can definitely publish it. You know, because whenever we use the late next step, uh, we can cite your paper so that uh, we are showing our awareness. <laughs> we can still use it. So then, uh, so my, my, my quick comment is the, uh, the actually kind of relevant to what Andrea said, but modality. So I'm kind of wondering, because the first study, they use a POIX. Yes. Course, right? Because POIX has a reading and listing. So I'm just wondering, like, uh, if Based on your study or based on your analysis, do you think that the modality also matters? If, for example, the Excel is actually going to be able to show more preparation with the uh, scores measured through the reading proficiency test or you know listening proficiency test. Potentially, and I'm, I'm very, well, I guess, and I do think that it, it it matters. In fact, in the background questionnaire, one of the things we ask them because we're testing university students, right? Perhaps falling into the problem that we'll have that we're testing the same university age, highly educated participants, so on and so forth. We ask for their discipline of study because those who will read more doing humanities literature perhaps also have an advantage in the lexile that all, those who do science don't. I don't know, right? That's, that's, that was our initial thought. We haven't explored that yet, but I, I do think that the lexile, the amount of reading you do in a second language will, will, will matter for the, the score that you get. Well, at least, I guess, that, that's my intuition. I guess it's something that we need to explore that so far, because again, as you've seen, the design is just looking at these two ties and there's not much I can say about that, but I guess my intuition would be that it might matter. Yeah. 
it's it's just a, 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 it, it's a quick historical note because for, for me, I used to be uh, uh, teaching at Bird Bank. And, and, and uh, one of the things that he was constantly struggling with was that people just did not accept that you could uh, establish an efficiency measure on the basis of vocabulary. And, and this is the kind of comment that you also get when you read that they say, that's not a reflection of proficiency, or that's not a reflection of English use, uh, you know, English teachers' use of English in the classroom. And, and, and he, he was uh, bitterly um, disappointed and frustrated by this constant negativity. Um, and, and, and so even though he did show that there was a high correlation with grammatical knowledge and other measures, it, it seemed to be never sufficient to convince the world. But, but it was a view, right? <laughs> Thank you I think someone hacked the chat. Yeah, I quit too late. Yeah. To locate my students. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much. And now, uh, I guess that Jim Mark doesn't need much of an introduction either. Well, I'm sure you all know, all of you here know him and those are online as well. But Jim Mark Dewell is professor of applied linguistics and multilingualism here at Baerbeck, where we're today physically. Uh, he's published a, an insane <laughs> amount of things, I, I, I would say, as all of you would know. A lot of work on, emo a lot of the seminal work on emotions has been of uh, of John Mark. And as I was going through his CV and number of publications, and I've seen the many things that, that he's done, I just saw that in 2021, he published 21 studies. <laughs> perhaps a coincidence, perhaps not. So perhaps <laughs> we'll see 22 publications in 2022. <laughs> but uh, on this note, uh, we're all very much looking forward to seeing what John Mark has uh, has. To, to say today about uh, whether flow is possible in the emergency of remote teaching for a language classroom. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Aloy. And, and thank you to all of you for uh, still being here. Uh, it, it's nice to be back uh, in in-person uh, meetings. Um, I would also like to point out that uh, the work uh, that I'm presenting to you was done in collaboration with two of my PhD students who are sitting there, uh, Iman and uh, Alfaf. Uh, and it was in fact um, a kind of an emergency project uh, during the lockdown, uh, where I realized that uh, being new students, they hadn't yet joined the community, that they felt a bit isolated, uh, and that it would be great to be doing some, uh, some real research project together, where they had to collaborate a lot because uh, I strongly feel that um, it's, you, you learn as much from your peers as you do from your supervisors and your teachers and that by collaborating they would learn a lot and that's exactly how it turned out to be. Now the topic of flow, um, I, I started teaching uh, French as a foreign language at Bergbeck in this very building uh, in 1994 taught French until 2004, and I was always teaching uh, on Friday evenings from six to nine. Um, so if you are a Bergbeck student, you, you remember it's the worst slot. So it's also the toughest slot if you're the teacher, because you are also tired after a week's work. Um, and hence, you have to make students forget that their friends are having a pint at the pub uh, and that they are hungry and that it's been a long week. And hence, it was absolutely crucial to get them uh, in a state of flow where they would totally forget what time uh, it was and where they were, and they would be 
totally immersed uh, in the activity. And the interesting thing was that that usually worked. Uh, and, and then by five to nine, I would say, okay, guys, five to nine, weekend is about to start. And, and the interesting thing then was um, to observe um, people falling out of that state of flow, where they suddenly realize, oh my God, it's five to nine. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, I'm tired. And they would kind of stagger out of the room and I would follow them, you know, being e exhausted because you realize teaching how much a physical uh, experience uh, it is. And, 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 and you just couldn't think at that point that 10 minutes ago, everybody was whoa, buzzing. And then suddenly you, you, you kind of, it hits you, you know, you, you, you've expended all your energy and you need to go home and, and go to bed. So, so that's when I became interested in flow. In, in fact, from a teaching perspective, rather than from a, a, a theoretical one. So um, the background um, of, of flow is uh, positive psychology, um, which is uh, the focus on the positive things in life rather than the traditional psychology which, look, uh, which looks at the things that go wrong uh, in life. And so hence the um, positive personality traits, um, but also uh, so like resilience and grit uh, and phenomena like flow. Um, and it, it's particularly uh, useful to uh, look at the work by Barbara Fredrickson, um, who um, designed the broad and built hypothesis. And her idea is that if uh, a learner is in a positive state of mind, they will absorb more than they, if they are in a negative state of mind. And as if you are teachers, you know that that is absolutely true. If, if students are too anxious, they shut down, they feel threatened, they, they, they don't want to participate. If, if you get them laughing, if you get them uh, in a positive mood, they're more likely to remember stuff and they're more likely to uh, progress. So this um, whole positive psychology um, has had a, a huge positive impact uh, on second language uh, acquisition. Now, flow, um, it's a concept the, designed by uh, Mikhail Selmihai, who died uh, quite recently, and who described flow as an optimal psychophysical state, uh, where you are in a state of total concentration, uh, you, you can't worry about anything else, uh, you're not self-conscious, your sense of time is, gets distorted. You forget how much time um, is, is, is going on or what the time is. Uh, and, and it's um, highly motivating. Being in a state of flow is something absolutely wonderful. Uh, and, and you want to prolong it for as long as possible. And that's also why, as a teacher, uh, it can be extremely frustrating if you have a student during the class who disrupts the flow. It can happen, of course, because then you realize just how hard it is for you as a teacher to get them back uh, in a state of flow. And sometimes it, it's not possible uh, anymore because people are suddenly tired at 8.30 instead of uh, 5 past 9 and you won't get them back uh, in a state of flow. And that can a bit, uh, be a bit frustrating. Now, the key to getting people in a state of flow is uh, that they find the right balance between challenge and skills. So if something is too hard, overly challenging, they give up, there is no flow. If it's too easy, they're not interested, they won't get in, in, into flow. So it's really a matter of finding the right balance. And I think it's comparable to video games. Uh, I'm, I don't play video games myself, but I, I know that you can play a certain game at the beginner's level. So it means that it won't be too challenging. You don't need Im immense skills to, to get to the next level. And as you get to the next level, it, your skills increase and the challenge increases uh, together. So I think it's, it's really uh, the same uh, phenomenon. Now, um, we were interested in finding out to what extent this magical state of flow is linked to the learner emotions, whether it was linked to their anxiety or enjoyment. And so anxiety has been, uh, interp uh, has been defined as the tendency to be anxious uh, in the L2 uh, class, in the L2 environment. 
uh, and enjoyment. Uh, Peter McIntyre and myself defined it as a, a positive emotion uh, that learners uh, experience when their psychological needs are met during challenging uh, language learning activities. So it's a complex, positively balanced uh, emotion. And I would say that it can be between medium and high arousal, meaning you can enjoy something intensely reading a book on your own. So it doesn't need to be in an, a buzzing uh, classroom or environment. So this is the scale we developed uh, to measure uh, foreign language classroom anxiety. Um, in fact, uh, based on uh, Elaine Horitz's uh, original 33 item scale. Uh, this is the short uh, form of the enjoyment scale that we um, uh, adapted uh, uh, last year uh, with three lower order uh, factors, teacher appreciation, personal enjoyment, and social enjoyment. And then, uh, of course, all of us have been talking about this uh, in between the sessions, about how nice it is to be back uh, in an in-person version uh, of this uh, Elsler colloquium. Uh, the online version was okay, but it wasn't as much fun uh, as it was. And I think that the literature seems to suggest that COVID and uh, emergency remote teaching has had the same effect on everybody, teachers uh, and learners. Uh, so the, the, you know, people had to cope uh, with this uh, relative uh, social uh, isolation. And uh, it has uh, effects uh, we discovered also on enjoyment and uh, anxiety uh, with uh, Pia Resnick. Uh, we discovered that there was a significant drop in enjoyment uh, uh, in um, uh, the online classes compared to the in-person classes. And that there was also a smaller but still significant drop in anxiety. So uh, people report, the uh, participants reported being less anxious because you know they couldn't be caught out or they couldn't be forced to participate. They could switch their cameras off, they could mute, they could hide. Uh, uh, so that was um, an explanation. And then with the same database that we uh, used uh, for, for the paper I'm presenting today, uh, we did a separate paper uh, on uh, where, where we found exactly the same thing. Um, a drop uh, in enjoyment in online classes, uh, higher levels of boredom uh, and, and slightly lower levels of anxiety. So this seems to be a pretty uh, systematic um, phenomenon. Now, research on flow really started in 2003, um, where Egbert found that flow experience could happen, that it was linked to task design, which is also why I asked about tasks, you know, depending on the type of task people may get in a state uh, of flow or not. And then uh, a number of studies that showed that, in fact, this uh, challenge skill balance is absolutely crucial. Uh, also that getting students in a state of flow is in fact a good way to strengthen their motivation because it's so nice to be in flow that you go to your next class expecting to be in a state of flow again. Uh, and so you, you crave that uh, state. Um, and um, Pignel and Albert pointing out that it's in fact still relatively under-researched in the literature, which is why we thought, hmm, okay, let's do some uh, work uh, on this. Now, some of the most amazing um, innovative work uh, on this is by uh, a team uh, around uh, Nozawa, a Japanese um, team, uh, where they found that there was in fact a, a link um, between uh, uh, students uh, at the level of the brain. So they, they had interbrain synchronization uh, that was linked to uh, interpersonal similarity of flow state dynamics. So people who were working together, do, uh, so they, they were pairs, their brains synchronized. And afterwards they reported that they were in a state of flow compared to people who were working along uh, so, so it's clear that um, flow is really a group, it's a social phenomenon. You get into a, a state of flow together uh, and it's much rarer to get in a state of flow when you are involved in, in a solitary uh, activity. So with Peter McIntyre, we um, have a study that we hope will come out soon in Applied Linguistics uh, Review, where we used um, Larson and Saint Mihai's experience sampling uh, method for items, uh, the percentage of time 
that the person felt was uh, totally absorbed, lost a sense of time, was totally fulfilled uh, and totally happy in the foreign language classroom. So we discovered that uh, the average uh, time uh, in state of flow was 59%. Originally we thought, isn't that high? Are, are they really in the state of flow for almost 60% of the class? They, we, we were a bit surprised by that, but then in fact compared with the literature, it seems to be rather normal. That, that's really what learners uh, report. And then uh, participants also reported on uh, open questions on uh, an open question on enjoyable episodes in their classroom. Uh, and that allowed us to uh, pinpoint the source of the enjoyment uh, and, and the duration uh, of the episode that they described and the intensity of uh, that episode. And then we correlated it with uh, enjoyment anxiety. And as expected, we found a much stronger positive correlation with enjoyment, a weaker negative correlation with anxiety, which is what you would expect. And then uh, also we discovered that in fact, um, the more advanced the learners were, the more likely they were to be in a state of uh, flow for longer uh, and um, compared to younger, uh, or less advanced learners who may have a spark of flow, but it was only a spark. It's only later that it became uh, more intense and, and longer. And so here we, uh, this is a graph showing that um, uh, if the, the source, if the source of the enjoyable episode was the self, that these people didn't spend that much time in flow compared to those who clearly in their episode described that the teacher was fantastic, the peers were great, and I was so enthusiastic. So that these people spent more time uh, in flow. Uh, and, and so you also see that those who described a, a powerful positive uh, emotion uh, episode, that they were more in flow, and that those uh, who um, described longer episodes of enjoyment were also the ones who were uh, in flow for a longer time. So here we wondered, um, is there, um, uh, do, do students spend a larger proportion of time in flow in in-person or uh, online uh, classes? Um, are the same people spending a lot of time in flow? Uh, and what are the uh, learner internal and external variables um, linked to uh, flow in both conditions? So um, the Alfaf and Iman use their local networks uh, so in uh, Saudi Arabia and in uh, Kurdish Iraq uh, to collect data from uh, EFL learners. And you see their uh, um, characteristics there. Um, and what we found was exactly what we expected, namely that yes, in fact, they did spend uh, close to half their time uh, in a state of flow in the online class, which you could say is not bad, right? Um, but of course, they remembering the, 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 the pre-COVID days uh, in the in-person classes, they remembered being in flow much, much uh, more. Uh, so the, although there is a statistically uh, significant difference, the effect size is in fact only small. And then we discovered also that the same students were in flow both in in-person and in uh, online classes. So that's again, something that you uh, could expect. And this was in a way the most interesting finding um, that the relationship between learner internal, learner external variables and proportion of time in flow was different in both conditions. So that you see there were much, uh, many more uh, significant uh, correlations for the in-person class uh, where being in flow was linked to age, English proficiency, uh, attitude towards English, towards the English teacher, frequency of use of English by the teacher. Whereas in the online uh, condition, it was in fact only the attitude towards the English teacher that was linked to flow. And even then the effect size was smaller. So um, uh, that, that was kind of an unexpected finding uh, because we, we, we expected that the same variables would have the same effect where it, whether it was in person or in flow. But it seems that in the flow, um, that in the online condition, uh, students, uh, that it didn't seem to matter much. 
So we, we looked also at the qualitative data that we collected through a number of open questions. Um, and as you see, uh, we asked um, the students what they liked uh, in uh, the in-person and online classes and what they disliked, so the positive and the negative. And we discovered that they mentioned different things like what they liked uh, in the in-person classes was the interaction. And I think that the interaction is really the key to flow. Uh, again, because it's a group um, phenomenon. Um, and there were things that they liked about um, uh, online teaching, namely the flexibility that it gave. And then uh, the, the, the anxiety arose in the online uh, condition was mostly to do with technology. And I didn't realize, but uh, you, technology, it could be like a power outage where or, or, or the, 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 the connection getting lost. And, and that could be a, a cause of uh, anxiety. And that would probably also break the flow because if you need to spend five or 10 minutes to log back in, you, you're completely out uh, of, uh, the, of the flow. Uh, so here are some of the things that uh, our participants said, you know, how much they enjoyed uh, unique uh, interactions and building the human uh, connection. And again, it's something we complained about, you know, we, we lack that human interaction uh, where, as we were sitting uh, behind our computers during uh, the lockdown. Uh, so the discussion, um, why is it that there was this difference between both conditions? I think that it, it's really crucially about context, that if you're sitting in a classroom surrounded by your peers with the teacher in front, and even within the familiar classroom where you, know, you may have posters and pictures, and, and all this reminds you that you are part of this bigger world and that you are part of this group. If you are sitting behind your computer, there are more sources of distraction because you know, people are maybe, you, maybe you are listening to music or you are eating or you turn your camera off. You are, in fact, you are disconnected uh, from what is happening uh, on the screen. And so you, you, you could easily feel that these um, online classes are emotionally disembodied, that, that it, it, it's like you, you can easily distance yourself from it and, and pretend that it is not there. If you are sitting in the classroom, you cannot pretend that these people are not all around you. Uh, and, and so, of course, some students may prefer being hidden. Um, but um, yeah, so the conclusion is that the teaching condition clearly affects uh, learners' time in flow. And I think that being in front of your computer means not just physical and social isolation, but in this case, I would say mental isolation, where they kind of closed off mentally so that everything that, they, that mattered for them getting in flow in the classroom suddenly didn't matter anymore. They, they like closed down uh, the, all the hatches. Um, and so no man or woman is an island. I guess that learning is harder on a small island, even uh, with an internet connection. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And I'm asking my, my students, do you remember from the qualitative data, did they mention anything like this? Yeah. So, so, so I, I agree with what is implicit in your question that in an online environment, of course, the teacher can create interaction and can create nice tasks, but maybe it is slightly harder uh, be because the teacher isn't there to say, you know, turn your phone off, now focus on this. Uh, and and, and it, it's easier for students to get distracted, I guess, yeah. So, so I guess as teachers, we did as well as we did, but we realized that it wasn't quite the real thing, right? Um, and, and I think that as teachers, in fact, we lacked the feedback from the faces 
of our students that got us into a state of flow and that we could communicate to the students through a process of emotional contagion. We were in fact also further away from our students. And, and I, I think it's like uh, joking to your computer screen is weird, right? Uh, but, but when you joke in front of a class and you see people react and you hear them react, you, you think, oh, this is working and you might continue doing this, but, but, but you wouldn't on the screen if you don't see the reaction. It, it's like, you know, watching the mirror. You don't make jokes to yourself in the mirror. Hello. Yes, I think that's very possible. I mean, just like I'm enjoying this conference, like I haven't enjoyed conferences in years, really, but because it's novel, the novelty of being all together again, I'm so happy that we are all together again. So I'm sure that I'm, I would get in a state of flow more easily uh, than pre-pandemic, uh, when maybe we were so used to it uh, that, that we didn't value just how, how precious uh, it, it was. Yeah. What was the most challenging part of the pandemic? Yes. I, I, yes, I totally agree. I think as a teacher in an online condition, you, you can't read the body language that you can read in a classroom. And, and, and we, again, if you're a teacher, you know that the moment students start looking at their phones or start looking out of the window that you are losing their attention, that, that they're obviously not in a state of flow anymore. And as long as it's only one or two students, that's okay. But if suddenly half of the students are doing this, then you're in trouble. So, so if you are online and you, you can't see this, you just continue as if everything was fine. And it turned out that you lost them, but you didn't realize you lost them. So that's again, why it's so nice to be back in teaching uh, in, in face to face. You see whether you are connecting with your audience. And in fact, you are looking at every member in the room and, and none of you can turn the camera off, right? <laughs> Um, but no, but, but I mean, I, I, I used to be teaching these black boxes. It, it was horrible. Uh, I, I felt totally depressed after a class. I said, you know, I've invested, I tried to be funny, but, but no, no one, I couldn't see anyone smile. And, and I was really depressed at the end of that class. So, so I see you nodding, you have had the same experience. <laughs> Feedback. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Andrea, are you? Yeah. Uh, m my bet would be that it applies much wider to education in general. Uh, we looked at, at, at language classes, but I, I'm pretty sure. Um, that, that any teacher um, w w would, would nod li like all of us uh, did. Uh, Parvane, you also raised your hand. Well, um, I raised my hand in my first uh, comments about my own experience and then a question. Yes, it's you know, uh, teaching online is totally different. I knew very well how my feelings were, but in autumn last year, we had to teach on campus and then we had to repeat the same lectures online for those who couldn't come. And that was a burden. That was the moment that you really got to see how your feelings were different between these two points. Mm. But my question is, did you how did you control or um, because in research we do our best to control variables as much as we can. Did you have any measures of control for uh, students, what they were doing when they were reporting their self-experiences of flow? 
for example, was it 20 minutes in the middle of a lecture that you were sure <coughs> they were all cooperating, or was it very general? It, it, it was very general. So um, correct me if I'm wrong. Iman, you want to say? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Online classes, so so there was a bit of variation in, in the sample. Yeah. I asked that question because again, on yes, I agree. It's very difficult to control. Yeah. Sure. And one day I insisted that a student should turn the, uh, the camera on, and she did, and she was behind the wheel driving. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> very streets of Bangkok. <laughs> Turn that off because I. Me too. Yeah. 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 No, I, I think that that's the, 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 the positive conclusion is that even in an online condition, flow is possible. So, so, so the, the glass is half full rather than half empty. <laughs> Pauline. I, I can send you the reference. So, so they, um, it, it's uh, our colleague from, uh, um, yeah, she has uh, access to um, advanced technology. Um, and so they were um, wearing wireless uh, sets that, that measured uh, brain waves. Um, and and, and it, it, so it was in fact a large interdisciplinary team. And this was the first time that, that there was brain research linked with EFL teaching. Uh, I will send you the paper. Yeah. Flow. The thing is that they did not conclude from the synchronization that these students were experiencing flow. They just noticed that it corresponded with what the students reported about their experience as it was unfolding. So the students were so, so verbal. Yes. Yes. No, 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 no. So they, they carried out the task that in pairs or, or alone, and their brain waves were measured. And afterwards, they were interviewed about the experience. And uh, that's where they could say that, oh, yeah, I definitely felt like this. You know, I definitely was in a state of flow. And then they noticed that, in fact, those who reported being in that state of flow, that there, uh, that, that there was synchronization. So, so that was nice triangulation, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I'm, 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 I'm thinking about uh, ethics applications there. I, w I, I will, I will give my students a moderate doses of LSD and let's see if, if, if they get in flow with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes.
Yeah, no, that makes per it makes perfect sense. And, and it was one of the things that came out of the qualitative data uh, that they reported lower anxiety because of that exactly, that they were not being looked at by the teacher all the time, that, that, uh, that, that lowered their anxiety and, and, and that allowed them to enjoy the activity more. Uh, yeah, uh, and, and the thing is that I think you can also have a state of flow in a classroom where nobody is speaking but where you hear the pens on paper, right? And, and, and you feel that everybody, you, you can feel the energy in the class. Everybody is focused on something. So they are in a state of flow, but there is actually no communication. Um, so, so, so I think that it would be interesting also to look at this phenomenon in more detail and, and then have interviewed the students afterwards after the class you know, even if you can't measure their brain waves, it would still be interesting uh, to maybe film them, observe them as they are doing a, a, a task. And then, you know, at what point did you reach a state of flow uh, and why? Uh, that would be really interesting also. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, 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 we did, that was not part of the research design, but, but that could be a research design. And I would encourage a person asking that question to do exactly that. That would be great. Yeah. Do you think there, there is a relationship between Avengers research and between flow and focus? Yes, I, I think that there is, the, the, the need to focus is absolutely crucial. And we all know that some people have more, struggle more in, in focusing. Um, and that's why I think that beginners typically maybe lack that ability to focus and that as you become more advanced, and I think it's not just language learning. I think this applies again to anything you do, whether it's uh, playing piano or doing sports, that, that as you become more expert at something, um, you, you, you become better at, at reaching that state of flow and, and focusing totally on what it is that you're doing. If you're only a beginner, maybe you are distracted more easily um, and, and then you don't reach that state. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.
que tout se passe très bien. So I just press on here. Yeah, okay. yep. so you are continuing guys. Bon, peut-être il veut il veut ah, ils prennent des photos. Okay. Est-ce qu'on laisse la porte ouverte, je oui. sais pas. Oui. Ça fait plus bien. Mais c'est pas mal en fait, il y a encore pas mal de monde hein, pour euh, parce que 3h30 ça ça me dit à Oui, c'est ça, c'est ça, ça c'est les gens sont motivés. <rire> OK, allons-y. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's uh, continue uh, this afternoon's session. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce a good friend of mine, uh, Victoria Magne, uh, who got her master's in applied linguistics at the University of Southampton. And then she decided to cross the Atlantic and <laughs> do her PhD at the uh, University of Sherbrooke. Um, It was also in Canada where you met uh, Kasia, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, his, historical uh, encounter, uh, because um, uh, since then, uh, Victoria has been uh, working uh, intensely uh, with uh, Kasia uh, and his team uh, on issues of uh, auditory processing, of accent. Uh, she's a senior lecturer at the uh, University of uh, West London. Uh, she's been looking after Elsler for also, uh, was it uh, pre pandemic? It's like pre and post pandemic. I know. <laughs> uh, you did a great job. So um, um, you've got the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jean Marc. It's good to be presenting among friends. <laughs> a little bit uh, less stress, but that's a. Uh, um, Uh, it's a conference, I guess, <laughs> when you don't know anyone. Uh, so, um, so today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the project that is still ongoing. We are uh, we're still connect collecting data, so you will see that the um, um, the numbers are not uh, that high. So um, we are, um, are going to increase them hopefully by by the end of the. Uh, by the end of the year, uh, so I'm um, I'm not doing it alone. Uh, so this is um, a group project, and uh, with Yui Suzukida from Jantendo University uh, in Tokyo, Japan, and I believe Yui is actually online uh, watching. And if you have questions, you can ask Yui, and she'll be able to uh, answer them online. Uh, she's also part of Kazuya's team, so. <laughs> Um, and uh, Juliana Ferry from Brunel University London, uh, who can't be here today, but uh, who is also part of um, this project. Um, so um, this is a slightly different, so it's a bit of a, it is kind of I'm following uh, on a sort of after Jean-Marc, so with a slightly different take on uh, SLA, so I'm uh, looking at uh, more social factors associated with uh, second language uh, learning. And uh, today uh, I want to talk about a language attitude. So what is a language attitude? It's often defined as um, a consistently favorable or unfavorable manner with respect to a given object. So for instance, accents or dialects. Uh, and because they are consistent, um, they are meant to be measured or are supposed to be, we're supposed to be able to measure them if they are consistent. So um, there are two, two main approaches to measuring uh, language attitude. One is direct. So we can just ask people, what do you think about this uh, specific language variety or this dialect and sort of elicit uh, their attitudes in that way. Um, however, obviously no one wants to appear prejudiced or, you know, horrible. So it's, it's very, uh, it's kind of, 
difficult to, you know, in a conversation say, oh, you know, you know, I hate accents or you know, something like that. Um, so uh, researchers and language actors have to be uh, kind of uh, creative and clever and think about a little bit more uh, interesting way of, uh, which, you know, uh, almost like coverted measures and trying to elicit those attitudes. So they've created the match guys technique, which was actually created in, in Canada. And um, the way to measure it is basically they would find a bilingual speaker who would record uh, the same text read aloud um, and then they would present uh, those samples um, to a group of listeners who would read those samples without realizing that in fact those samples were produced by the same speaker. So it's in some ways it's like tricking the person because the voice quality, the pitch, everything remains the same. The only difference is the accent. So thus they could infer that the, the, what we're looking at is linguistic stereotypes rather than actual evaluations of what constitutes speech. So it sounds very clever. Obviously there's lots of uh, um, issues with that approach, but <laughs> it's, it's still, it's been crit widely criticized, but it's still used in some studies. Um, so when we ask about, uh, so uh, since 60s, uh, 1960s, this uh, paradigm uh, has exploded. There's a lots of, uh, lots of uh, papers uh, looking at language attitudes. And um, it's kind of, um, when we try to identify the dimensions uh, that constitute language attitudes, we have these three main dimensions, which is solidarity. Uh, so the adjectives that uh, researchers use such as pleasant or friendly or likable, uh, status traits, which is educated, successful, intelligent, and dynamism, which we don't see that often, but it's one of the major traits as well, which is often represented by the, um, by the trait, uh, by the adjective energetic. So uh, once the paradigm has been established, and initially it was to look at uh, French, uh, French Canadian, um, uh, French Canadian accents of French <laughs> and, uh, and English. However, um, we are now have uh, a lot of literature about um, uh, accented speech and different accents of English. So the findings from language attitude research have consistently found that if someone uh, uh, speaks a what is perceived a standard variety, which is, for instance, if we're talking about English, uh, but it's consistent in different languages as well. Uh, for instance, in English, we're talking about Midwest, kind of North American Midwestern sort of dialects, um, uh, though that's debatable. And in English, um, it would be uh, received pronunciation or RP. So they tend to be fa uh, rated more favorably on traits such as um, uh, status or prestige, meaning education or, and wealth. And non-standard variety are rated more favorably in terms of social attractiveness or solidarity. So for instance, uh, I don't know if we think about, if we're talking about the UK and dialects uh, in the UK, thinking about um, Liverpudlian accent. So for instance, uh, often depends if you're in group, you, you rate it favorably on solidarity, but if you're out group, you may see it as um, in some ways um, uh, less, <laughs> is less prestigious accent. Um, however, uh, with foreign accents, findings are a little bit, um, a little bit different. With foreign accent, what uh, researchers have found is that uh, speakers tend to re speakers who speak accented, um, um, and I'm say English because most research has been done with English because of its status as the international language, they seem to be received less favorably in terms of both solidarity and status. So they're downgraded on, on, on both major dimensions. There's no literature looking at uh, dynamism at this point. Uh, because, and also um, EFL students, they often see native speakers, uh, native speaker models as desirable and they also downgrade their own variety as undesirable. And that's the one that they share as well. Uh, so when we, what, what, what do I mean by, uh, by accent. So, because I'm talking about language attitudes and accent. So accent is broadly defined as the phonological characteristics of speech. And in SLA research, second language accent is conceptualized as phonological transfer 
of first language phonological fe features to the speaker's second language. And research uh, done by Kaziez, <laughs> Kaziez and uh, uh, Pavel Trofimovich. Um, so the, uh, second language accents have been found to be linked to pronunciation accuracy, particularly in the production of um, segmentals and the word stress. Uh, so, but in those studies, uh, second language speakers accentedness is typically measured according to the proximity of the speaker's use of English to the standard variety. So it's basically comparing how far you are on the spectrum from those varieties. So with this study, we wanted to see whether that would make a difference if we actually did not include native speakers of English at all. Uh, so that's kind of, uh, I'm using a different keyboard. Um, so what we so what we also uh, what is also apparent from research uh, is that listeners so uh, listeners are also important um, so we find that if if you are familiar with an accent it's uh, very um, it's easier for you to have kind of an opinion of that accent because you are familiar and um, but what we also find that uh, listeners rely on different um, elements when they provide their evaluative judgments. So, for instance, um, uh, Dustin uh, Crowther and uh, Pavel Trofimovich and Talia, uh, they, they looked at French uh, listeners and Mandarin listeners, and they found that they paid attention to different, um, different features, basically, when they were evaluating speech. Uh, there is also another factor that listeners often make errors. So we assume that the task we said we asked them to do that they understood and they are doing the task. But in fact, we may be wrong because uh, there are studies that suggest, um, again, I'm using the wrong keyboard, um, that often the speakers are evaluated by their assumed nationality. So we can pilot it as many times as, as we want, but it depends on the actual final group of listeners who are listening to the speech. So you never know what, because we never actually ask what nationality they think the participants are or whether they think they're native speakers of English or not. And McKinsey's 2015 studies uh, findings suggest that listeners uh, initially ca categorize um, samples, speech samples, either as belonging to native speakers or non-native speakers before they make any fine-grained judgment. So that's a lot of <laughs> background uh, for a study um, that we've done. So we wanted to bring it all together. So we wanted to see whether this listener factor for instance, how does categorization or miscategorization of second language accents actually affect language attitudes of Japanese listeners toward Japanese accented English? And as you can see, we did not include any native speakers for comparison. So it was Japanese listeners evaluating Japanese speech. And we also wanted to see what type of pronunciation errors affected that social miscategorization of native speaker and non-native speakers. So which features were important, which features they paid attention to. And also we had a qualitative element, uh, which we just wanted to see what their uh, attitudes are towards L1 and L2 accented speech. So what did, how did we do that? So first, uh, the speech samples, uh, so there were 44 male and uh, female first language Japanese speakers of English of different uh, second lang language proficiency. Um, so we use the task that is outlined in Saito at all 2016. Uh, so this is the uh, a little story that they had to produce. And also this is, is, is a difference because it's sort of a spontaneous speech as opposed to read aloud elements of the match guys technique. So it's kind of, uh, so we, we could not control uh, for the content of the speech. So that's obviously a confounding, uh, not necessarily confounding, but it's something that we, uh, we, we are going to look um, uh, to explore further later on. So they produce, uh, they produce this uh, picture, picture description. 
And after the speech were collected, we followed Trofimovich and Sachs on 2012 um, paradigm in terms of analyzing, doing speech analysis. Uh, so the analysis was done by two coders uh, and the, the interrater agreement was uh, quite high. So these are the different dimensions that we used to, um, to analyze the, the speech. After that, uh, we each sample, uh, so I'm only reporting on 12 uh, first language Japanese uh, listeners. Uh, so, but we are we are now at almost 50. So, hopefully, <laughs> by the end of the year, we'll get to higher numbers. So, each sample was rated by uh, 12 uh, first language Japanese listeners on a six-point semantic differential scale on a number of traits, and we also included this category of native, non-native. So, we wanted to see whether they felt that the um, that the voice belonged to a native speaker or non-native speaker. So these are the. Uh, this is just an example. Uh, this is actually the the all the traits that we've used. Uh, so we've taken them from uh, previous studies, uh, uh, specifically Jean and Hopper's when they kind of um, uh, try to uh, find the common um, sort of denominators for for the traits. Uh, so they kind of aligned with the solidarity status uh, dynamism dimensions of speech evaluation. And um, so the proficiency of the listeners it was relatively low. So we have A2, B2 uh, proficiency. Uh, the age was, um, uh, mean age was 20 and they were taking English classes with the Japanese instructors and they had no experience of study or work abroad. So we could say that they, uh, they were naive, um, naive listeners with uh, not a lot of um, experience. So following the rating task, we invited them to provide comments on how important native like pronunciation was to them. And data was analyzed using a series of t-tests, uh, mixed effects modeling, and a thematic uh, analysis. So what, uh, what are the results? So our the first research question um, is, how does miscategorization of L2 accents affect language attitudes of Japanese listeners towards Japanese accented speech? And as you can see, it does. <laughs> It's in fact affected all 12 dimensions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if the if the Japanese listeners believed erroneously uh, that the voice belonged to a native speaker of English, they rated them higher on all dimensions. So it's <laughs> uh, so, but there were no native speakers. There were, they were different proficiencies, but there were not native speakers involved in those studies. So we wanted, so all, so all dimensions, so as you can see, all dimensions were affected, almost there. So, so we wanted to look at uh, kind of what actually affected um, those uh, ratings. Uh, so the results of mixed effect modeling. So what types of pronunciation errors affect the social miscategorizations of native speaker, non-native speakers? So you can see uh, we have now only four out of 12 dimensions. So that's probably linked to, uh, because there are other things like uh, grammar and uh, vocabulary and, uh, and, and the rest of it. So, and, and we also looked only on at Japanese uh, speech. So uh, the trade friendly, uh, we could see that the more word stress errors um, uh, speakers made, the less friendly they were perceived. And in terms of clarity, uh, the more vowel insertions they had, the less clear they appeared to the listener. Uh, in terms of likability, faster meant actually more likable. So the faster you spoke, the more likable you, you, you were perceived to be. And in terms of active, the dynamism trait, um, it's understandable it was linked to word stress errors and articulation rates. So the faster, the more active, which is probably like an intuitive finding, you would agree that if you speak faster, you may be seen as more active. So we found that uh, quite interesting. So we keep exploring that and we want to include other dimensions as well. And in terms of the qualitative analysis, um, sorry, um, 
yeah, so the results of the thematic analysis, we kind of, we put, uh, we, uh, we coded um, them uh, separately and uh, we, we compared our themes and we agreed on two main themes, which is, um, which is um, a native likeness and comprehensibility. And as you can imagine, they were in sort of a, a, a pool. There was a pool between these two dimensions with comprehensibility, uh, kind of looking at communicative success and inclusivity. So it doesn't matter because I want to be, uh, uh, you know, I want to be understood and I, and I feel this sense of camaraderie with other um, uh, non-native speakers. However, we can't downplay the role of um, prestige, social prestige, and um, kind of ease of understanding because of mutual intelligibility of uh, sort of more standardized um, varieties. So uh, in terms of um, how can we relate this to the previous findings? So what, what I think is important here is that the miscategorized L2 speech received more positive evaluation, which is an important consideration for study design. So if you are interested in exploring um, this kind of paradigm, it's very important to include actually either they guess the nationality or they indicate whether it's a native or non-native speakers to uh, ensure that they are doing what you want them to do. So kind of, it's almost like a stop and check kind of thing. Um, so it looks like some of the samples were rated by the assumed nationality of the speaker as similar to Bainhof uh, study. Uh, and familiarity, we were expecting that they would recognize them as uh, belonging to Japanese speakers, but they did not guarantee recognition. So which is again, another factor uh, in terms of methodological uh, design. Um, we also, our results also suggest that intonation and segmental accuracy might be instrumental in eliciting positive attitudes towards second language speech from second language users. And that could be because they are exposed to native uh, models and native speaker models in the classroom. And it's very likely that they rely on those models uh, when they were making uh, their judgment. Even though they were not present, they were still relying on uh, on those models um those positive attitudes i found uh, there was a paper that came out in 2014 about the reference frame effect um, it suggests that language attitudes can shift in response to the reference frame that listeners adopt when making social evaluations so by not providing the native speaker model for comparison our participants potential negative attitudes that could have been there because they still uh, rated a group of because there were no native speakers so they still rated uh, the, the, their fellow Japanese speakers on a positive uh, uh, scale uh, so perhaps they were attenuated because there was no model uh, for for comparison so in terms of limitation ideally we want to follow up with in-depth interviews uh, to kind of see that ambivalency uh, and explore it a little bit more and oh, the role of vocabulary and grammar because it was not a read aloud task, it was a spontaneous kind of um, more spontaneous speech. And um, also uh, whether the expertise of listeners would make any difference because um, naive listeners can still detect uh, errors and use them as cues to make evaluative judgments. So perhaps you know whether that exper expertise would make uh, would make a difference. So thank you, and these are our email addresses <laughs> if you want to get in touch. Yes, Jean Marc. <laughs> Oh yes, please. So it's exactly, exactly the same. same. Yes. Oh, oh my God. Yeah, the frame effect, the reference frame effect yeah. is so important. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. I was wondering that if you could 
So you mean like fooling native speakers in some ways? With re with uh, with the reading task, I think we potentially if there's they could be trained, but then again it would uh, because um, even in reading, I think there's certain features that would give us. Give, give me away for instance so i would i guess it depends like uh, uh because of the individual differences then would play a role right so whether are you good at imitating or imitation is your auditory processing on point <laughs> things like that I think it would it would potentially yeah I find it with French I think it depends how much you sort of uh, there's kind of the element of how much you've heard other accents because when I speak uh, French uh, I find that people in France they often a bit they're quite hesitant before they actually say you're not from France they sort of just kind of listen and then they're like mm, maybe but it doesn't mean that i have native like accent in french it just kind of uh, uh they sort of all think maybe it's a variation of french you know <laughs> maybe um so yeah it's uh it's yeah no it's an it's it's an interesting it's an interesting thing because i find that um in english it's often uh, accent is so important because it's also uh in the past and is i would say maybe in some ways today as well would uh, indicate your social status so people are very attuned to social cues associated with accents um but it does work with lower proficiency students because they would uh, they would think you were a native speaker because of the do you see what i mean so it's uh, that definitely works but yeah no it's a, it's a great thing. Um, i have a question but it's important to whether we are like, you know, yes Which one? Uh, you had a category for, you know, whether they were friendly. Yes, this one. Did, were they ever given uh, an option of saying not applicable? Because when you listen to someone speak for 90 seconds, I saw yes. seconds of speech. Yeah. For me, it's very difficult to make a judgment about whether they're friendly or unfriendly, intelligent or unintelligent. So, that, and not, not only your study in the literature in that area, are people ever given an opportunity to say that this is not relevant? Uh, and that is one of the major limitations of this paradigm because um, it's often people have no opinion. So and there's no option to say I have no I have no opinion. So it's it's you just kind of pointed out that one of the major limitations of MGT and language attitudes in general because you're forced in some ways because of it to have an opinion yeah when you uh when you perhaps never heard this accent or not not necessarily have an opinion so yeah it's it's one of the one of the limitations maybe we should you know when if we do if i, if I with you we could add you know <laughs> not not applicable yeah 
to have, yeah. But if you, if you, even friendliness, you know, some of these make sense to me. Like, uh, surprisingly, friendliness is actually a trait that keeps coming because, for instance, here is um, more word stress errors, less friendly. So, friendly is, is somehow a trait that people, in, you know, when you listen to speech, you're like, oh, that sounds friendly. Like, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's trickier on things like, um, I don't know, uh, talkative or passive, yeah, things like that. So, um, but yeah, no, that's that's a great point and is a big limitation of this sort of paradigm. Uh -huh. So, a clarification of the Zena question. Did you say your latest were uh, language learners as well? Yes. So, do, would, you ex would you expect to replicate these results if you were looking at Japanese speakers of English in the corporate, corporate world? Oh, that's very good. They say have the kind of native kind of models that we keep reinforcing in the classroom, and they would potentially be exposed. Yeah, 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 yeah. In non-native English in the international corporate world. In fact, uh, let me say promote one of our students again. She is looking at attitudes in the corporate world of the US against non-native accents mm -hmm. and the hypothesis that those will not be as as negative as some of these trying to have names to the model so perhaps it's interesting yeah, yeah absolutely so it's kind of links to um the next steps uh naive versus trained but it could be naive versus experienced uh or have more exposure to um so we could you could we could almost use this as a baseline and then see what um yeah Mm. <laughs> Not doing good enough. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. I'll, say, I'll say that uh, at least the preliminary results show that people in the corporate world also have a lot of negative attitudes against non speakers. Like we look at higher. So then you have to play the joke depending on which corporate world you look at. The US yeah, yeah, it's a it's a widespread and Lippy Green, she was the, the 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 first one who looked into it and discrimination in court, for instance, you know, so the evidence is not is perceived as reliable, for instance. So yeah, there's a that's um, a, a, a quick comment on, on what Nagane was, was saying. Um, I, I seem to remember quite a lot of um, uh, literature in psychology that indicates that you form an opinion when you hear a person that in fact you have an opinion after 15 seconds. Yeah, it's very quick, yeah. It's amazingly quick how you, you decide that the person is this and, and that you could answer all these scales because after 15 seconds you, you more or less have an opinion and that it's it's hard for you to revise that opinion. Afterwards. Yeah, it's 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 more like at the, at the stage, like, do I like it? Do I want to kind of, uh, what is my next step kind of? So, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, it just happens very quick. Yes. No, no, but you, you, what you, it's, 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 as I said, it's something that when you do that kind of research, it's something that you, I always have to put in limitation. It's like well, number one limitation. Then, yeah. Yeah. Some of them, really, to me, it, you know, it just 
Yeah, no, that's that should be. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's a tricky. It's kind of trying to. Uh, it's because it's a covert method in some ways, you know. So it's it's kind of finding that balance. Yeah, exactly. So finding that balance between asking directly when they will pro probably not volunteer opinion, but then anonymity kind of allows that uh, and not face to face because it's done. Uh, they are listening in their own time or in the lab. So, for instance, they're not faced with me who has an accent and, and evaluate someone who has an accent because that would have an influence. They would, you know, uh, yes. <laughs> well, that's actually a, a, a brilliant question. Uh, my MA super, uh, I was in Southampton. My MA supervisor was uh, Jennifer Jenkins, who introduced the concept. <laughs> so I'm very familiar, and in fact, <laughs> know firsthand. <laughs> Uh, the, the notion of uh, the concept of English as a lingua franca and saw the entire center of English as a lingua franca grow in, at the University of Southampton. So my research is in fact uh, social, you know, it is social nature and it is going, um, I'm, I'm kind of, I have this split personality, so you can still have it, you can do, you know, you can do uh, SLA research and then acknowledge that it's a concept that you use and you use it to, to have a baseline and something to compare against in some ways. And, um, you know, I, I kind of have this split personality, so I, I do research looking very much at kind of standard English and language ideology and the notion of, uh, I don't know, translanguaging and English as a lingua franca. Uh, so it's, I think it's, uh, it's good to explore different things and think how they can actually, in fact, work together and how they can, um, you know, sort of uh, enrich uh, mutually be uh, beneficial. And uh, I, you know, I have had an effect on Kazuya and we did the study uh, looking only on second uh, on uh, 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 second language users uh, using um, English in London, 
uh, and uh, and study and the results were very kind of similar to what you observe with native speakers as well. And uh, Jean Marc's work on LX, or, you know, with Juliana and I, a paper we published on uh, kind of conceptualizing uh, users of English as LX users rather than native speaker versus non-native speaker. So it is possible to kind of hold uh, different paradigms, uh, you know, in your head. Yes. Well, it depends who you ask. Do you, do you see what I mean? If you if if if, if you are ask a, a diehard elf person, you know they would say they have nothing in common. But uh, but I do, I disagree with that. I think there's uh, there's always way to bring things together and learn from each other. And and uh, yeah, it's just uh, exploring and doing things that you enjoy. You know, and um, as Jean Marc said, it doesn't mean. Uh, if what you observe and what your participants are saying it doesn't mean that you agree with it and that's kind of gives you that critical discussion in fact and or gives you ideas of how to raise awareness or maybe create a workshop or something like that so then you can actually um, I don't know expose your participants to more diversity and uh, so it's yeah it's that's the thing yeah hi <laughs> Uh, so the idea of language attitude research is that they go hand in hand so that people can make assumptions about your personality based on the way you speak. Uh, so it doesn't mean they're correct. Yeah, so these are, they are all, most of them are not, or they're stereotypes, but it's very important to study stereotypes because, for instance, when uh, someone applies for a job, you know, they go in and, they, and the panel already has assumptions about their personality before they even said hello. I mean, actually, after they said hello, they heard their voice and they already created an opinion whether that person will get the job in some ways. Uh, so it's it's that's the whole point. So they, the, you know, b based on the way someone speaks, so their voice um, and even voice qualities as well. So they they affect the way the person is perceived. So it's almost like it's a substitute for your personality, even though you are much more not you like a person is much more complex and you know diverse and multifaceted, but because of the way someone speaks, they they already perceived as having built a personality, which is again a historical thing that we needed in old you know old days to kind of who is in group, who is out group, who is enemy, who is a friend, things like that. But we continue to do that. And the idea is kind of is to avoid discrimination, obviously, and sort of have more inclusive 
practices that are not rooted in uh, in something like language discrimination. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, and this is the. Sorry, uh, I don't look at the screen. Okay. Because it's a slide behind. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> so, this is my honor to introduce Professor Pauline Forster. Uh, Pauline Foster taught Applied Linguistic at St. Mary's University for over 30 years. And uh, if you Google Pauline Foster, you will see that it says that she has recently uh, retired. But that's not true. <laughs> she is, in fact, an honorary research fellow at, um, at the Institute of Education, UCL. She is very, very active. Um, I overheard Pauline uh, talking earlier. The only difference is that now she gets a little bit more sleep. <laughs> uh, Pauline's research interest um, uh, is in area of SLA, especially task-based language learning, uh, age effects on ultimate attainment. Um, and uh, her recent paper, if you're looking for a dissertation topic or a PhD project, uh, her uh, recent paper on research agenda uh, influencing for the next 10 years is excellent. And it's an excellent source if you want to, uh, you know, if you are interested in fluency and if you want to see what are the hot topics for the next 10 years, <laughs> uh, it's published in Journal of uh, Language Teaching. Um, so, and Pauline is also the founding member of the Alpha Group and a very active, <laughs> active member. Uh, and, uh, um, and I just uh, wanted to uh, thank you for your help in organizing the colloquium as well. Ooh. So it was the three of us. Very small. <laughs> no, no, no. And very small. <laughs> uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Well done for sticking it out this long. Uh, and uh, I hope I can finish on a high note, you know, for you, you stayed this long. Um, so I'm presenting some work that I've done in collaboration with colleagues in New Zealand at the Waikato Institute of Technology. And I'm uh, really sorry that I've never met Jonathan or Anthea. I was about to go when COVID put an end to that. So I, I've never met them except on Zoom, but I've had a very, very good time uh, working with them. Um, so what I'm, <laughs> in order to introduce the subject of the research that we've done together, I need to look at an acronym that I find a bit silly, really. It's playful for about, five seconds and then it, it isn't but it's important to uh to establish this um this stands for uh people um who are from backgrounds that are western industrialized educated rich and democratic and we could call them wired you know but they're known as as weird and the reason that these this is an interesting point that's been raised recently is that um, it's been estimated, I think this, these are the, uh, the authors, that 80% of participants in social and behavioral science research studies are from those backgrounds. Uh, and yet those backgrounds comprise only 12% of the world's population. So they are 
the, the sort of people that we've been talking about a lot today in, in terms of participants that we've been uh, uh, hearing about in the studies presented today are in this view an unrepresentative minority of the human race and they're also because of the their western industrialized educated rich and democratic backgrounds uh something like outliers you know they they are on many scales uh well beyond and very different from the majority of the human population so now this was social and behavioral science research studies but the question has been put quite legitimately that a similar observation could be made for sla who are the participants and where are they from and are they representative of the human race and one of the features of people who are not from these Western industrialized, educated, rich democratic backgrounds is literacy. And there's a lot been written in the last, say, 10, 15 years about the influence of L1 literacy on second language acquisition. And one of the things has been, one of the questions that's been uh, asked is if literacy is an influence on processing linguistic information. And that's a big if, which is why I've got it in italics and if it's associated with distinct ways of learning second languages so this is an idea been put forward by Tyrone and colleagues and also by Havron and Arnon then can SLA research findings garnered from literate participants literate in their L1 audience, be assumed to apply to language learners with limited or no literacy in their L1 so that's a really good question and it's obviously an empirical question and it obviously points towards doing replications of studies that we take to be very important in telling us important information about second language acquisition um, we should do them again but with a different population with low literacy um, participants and in fact um, that's why I'm working with these people uh, in New Zealand. The uh, Journal of Language Learning is in the process of um, hosting a lot of studies um, uh, which are being replicated with this, this thing in mind. You're, you're replacing the partial replications, but they are replacing the, the participant pool with low literacy. Um, L1 learners. And this is the one which we are doing. It's a paper published a quarter of a century ago by Peter Skian and me, um, which you may or may not have read, but I'm not going to talk too much about it because I want to sort of cut to the chase very quickly with the replication. But the, this paper was set within the task-based uh, learning and teaching uh, world. It concerned L2 learners transacting. Um, uh, it's the idea that L2 learners in task-based learning, they transact an oral task and can attend to language form incidentally while doing that rather than deliberately, like in a PPP classroom. And the idea is, and we've heard about this actually uh, earlier, uh, that Skian's model, uh, limited attention, uh, um, model means that when learners are transacting a task where they're focused on uh, one element of performance, which might be being accurate, it might be being complex, it might be being fluent, that comes at the cost of them having insufficient attention resources to pay attention to other dimensions of their performance. And that therefore pre-task planning time manages to increase your attentional capacity because it reduces the demands of having to attend to form and content and allows oral performance to be more accurate and or more complex and or more fluent in the L2. That's, that was the idea, and that's what we did. Um, and this was the design of the 1996 study. We had three tasks, present, which presented graded levels of cognitive demands, you know, from the least demanding to the most demanding. And that is a personal information exchange was considered to be the least cognitively demanding. A picture narrative was 
more so cognitively demanding and the most cognitively demanding was a decision making task that required you to use your powers of reasoning and argument. There were three planning conditions. There were learners who were given no planning time, learners who were given 10 minutes of unde undetailed planning time, and another group that were given 10 minutes with detailed, with advice on how to plan before the task started. There were three performance dimensions, which were what I've said, classic accuracy, complexity, fluency. There were 32 participants and they were garnered from conveniently intact EFL classes at lower intermediate level. And incidentally, 25 years later, I'm thinking they were all high level L1 literacy, although we didn't care about that at the time. In brief, Peter and I found very significant effects of planning on fluency, that giving planning time allowed the learners to do those tasks much more fluently. There were significant effects also on complexity of the language that they used to talk about uh, the concepts of the task, um, such that the detailed planning gave you more complexity than the undetailed planning, which gave you more complexity than the no planning. There were less clear cut effects on accuracy. This was kind of the other way around, strangely, that the undetailed planning time gave you more accuracy than the detailed planning time, which gave you more accuracy than the no planning. And there was an interaction between task type and planning on all performance dimensions. That is to say, the narrative and decision-making tasks were more accurate, more fluent, and more complex than the personal information exchange task when there was planning given. And we then, back then, wrote about a trade-off between the competing goals of complexity and accuracy, as I said, in the context of having to prioritize your attentional resources. So, here we are doing a partial replication of this now. Um, we have three tasks which are the same, all right, except that, um, I'll tell you about in a minute, we, we couldn't use exactly the same because time has moved on. I'll tell you about that in a minute. We have two planning conditions, only planning and non-planning, uh, and non-detailed planning to make things easier for ourselves. We have three performance dimensions as before, accuracy, complexity, fluency. We have 45 participants this time recruited from former refugee communities in Hamilton, New Zealand, who were attending English as an additional language classes. And they were at sort of CEFR, B1, bit of B2 as well. So they were, they were consistent with the earlier learners. They all took a literacy test they, in their L1, and they were all they all came out as having very low level or no literacy in their L1. So the differences in the original study were inevitable, but they were minor. We had to adjust the task to suit the participant profile. We we couldn't really involve the task of you know deciding how long to send to prison a woman who had murdered her husband after she had found him in bed with another woman because it would have been. Uh, difficult to get that past the, um, uh, the ethics committee. It was probably outraged a few people there. We couldn't have done it in a counterbalanced order. That just turned out to be impossible. There was only one planning condition, as I've said. And uh, yes, we screened them for literacy. And we also employed another measure of accuracy because we've got a better measure, I would say now, than we had 25 years ago. The hypotheses are, and I'm racing through this, um, five, that the plan performance would be characterized by greater fluency and greater complexity and greater variability, but not greater accuracy. And the effects of planning will be greatest on the task with the heaviest cognitive load and least on the task with the lightest cognitive load. So it'd be more on that decision-making task. But the decision-making task was having to decide how long to punish someone in prison for who'd done some kind of 
uh, crime, which you could see as very serious, or you could see as nothing at all, depending on your opinion. So there's a lot of reasoning that had to go on there. And this is what we are uh, basically, again, uh, the performance dimensions and measures for these three things were you know, error-free clause ratio, weighted clause ratio, index of subordination, index of variety. There were various measures to pick up repair fluency, such as um, replacements, reformulations, or starts, and breakdown, which is largely pausing and silence. So now with the analyses, I realized as I was writing these slides for you, this could go on a very long time. So I'm giving you almost no details of them because I want to get to the results really. Um, but I've prepared the slides for them if you want later. Uh, we did two-way mixed ANOVAs. The independent variables were task type, which is within participants, and planning condition, which is between participants. We, um, and in, in, the, in the, what I'm going to show you, um, it, you need to know that when I talk about task one, that's the easy one, the personal information exchange. When I talk about task two, that's the decision-making task. That's the most difficult. And when I talk about task three, that's the narrative, which is sitting in the middle. This was the order they were done in, task one, task two, task three. There you are, if you really want the slides with lots of numbers. I've got them. But what you really want me to talk about, I think, is what we found. Right? So this is a replication of a study done 25 years ago, which is very, very close, except for this one thing. These learners are not literate or they have very low literacy in their L1. Will this mean that they perform differently because they have different habits of mind? Uh, the argument goes that they have less access to explicit meta language that they could possibly draw on during planning time, but they haven't got that. They haven't got that habit of thinking about language in that explicit way. Um, they don't have a habit. The, the, the argument would go that they, they have um, less ability to think of language in the abstract now. I'm completely agnostic about this. So I was just really interested to see what would happen. And I hope you're all sitting there thinking, oh, I'm guessing that this is what was going to happen. And so now I'm going to tell you. So the first hypothesis. Could we bet? Yes. <laughs> Open a book. We, we, we write somewhere Open a book. When, when right, do it now. What do, you, what do you think? What do you think? Later. Yeah, show me later. Plan performance will be characterized by greater fluency. Is the hypothesis? Did the ANOVAs, you know, and then don't, and the outcome was not upheld. All right, not upheld. In terms of repair fluency, there was no significant difference between the planned and unplanned conditions. <laughs> In terms of breakdown fluency, no significant di difference between the planned and unplanned condition. And mean scores were actually in the opposite direction to that hypothesis. They actually went the other way, and I've got them somewhere. I can show them to you if you want to. In terms of proportion of silence, silence to time on task, there was no significant difference between planned and unplanned condition. And again, the mean scores of the amount of time they spent not saying anything at all was in the opposite direction to the hypothesis. All right? So big surprise. Don't know if you've won your bet with yourself. <laughs> H2, planned performance will be characterized by a greater complexity of expression as measured by the number of clauses per AS unit. So this is an index of how much syntactic packing they can put into one AS unit. All right, not upheld. No statistically significant effect for planning on syntactic complexity. And that's all I have to say about that. It just didn't happen. I only measured it one way. But the next one, H3, is syntactic variety. That is to say, greater variability 
in the plan condition in the use of tenses, aspect, modality, and voice. So there's just more going on. They're sort of using more of the English language possibilities here. Not upheld. Not upheld. The statistically significant result was in the opposite direction to the hypothesis. Right? So they were less varied if they planned. They went the other way. H4, planned performance will not be associated with any increase in accuracy. Now this, this, was a this was saying it won't increase because there has been very mixed effects for accuracy as a result of planning time. It's difficult to pick up, it's inconclusive, or it's sort of vaguely yes and vaguely no. So we just went down with there won't be any, any effect for accuracy. And that was upheld just because I think we decided to phrase it that way. <laughs> Very clever. No significant effect for planning on either accuracy measure. So we did two. We did the weighted clause ratio and the error-free clauses. Error-free clauses were done in the original study. Um, nothing going on there. The weighted clause ratio mean scores across all the tasks, however, were in the opposite direction. If they planned, they had mean scores on all those tasks that were less accurate, but this did not reach significance. At H5, the effects of planning will be greatest on the tasks with the heaviest cognitive load and the least on the tasks with the lightest cognitive load. Well, as you know, we really didn't have much in the way of effects for planning, um, but it wasn't upheld. All right. No significant interaction was found between planning and task type on any of the performance variables investigated in the previous four hypotheses. Oops, sorry, this button is very sensitive. But there was a consistent and highly significant effect for task type, whose performance is on the cognitively least demanding task, the personal information exchange, leading to the most, tending to lead to the most accurate, least syntactically complex, least syntactically varied, and most fluent performance. So, where, do you, where, where does this leave us? There's little in the way of statistically significant effects, as you've seen, which so many of the results are pointing us in the opposite direction to the 1996 paper that I think it's worth taking that as a serious signpost for something. So it's possible to suggest that planning time led these low literacy L1 uh, users of English to be more hesitant and less ambitious in what they decided to say in the performance of the task, right? They actually, it took the wind out of their sails and it made them possibly more accurate as well. Is planning time therefore an inhibiting factor or is it creating space for reflection on performance, which they're actually using in a positive manner, even though it's making them, it's taking the wind out of their sails. They're sailing too fast in the wrong direction possibly, so it's a good thing to take the wind out of their sails. So in line with H4, there was no effect for planning on accuracy. And H4 was the way it was because partly L, these low literacy language learners have, have been said to have little access to meta language, little habit of reflecting consciously on grammar, so not able to draw on those things during planning time, which literate learners, L1 literate learners are able to do. And as I've said, that's not the story from the mean scores. They're all going the other direction, suggesting somehow, somewhere, in a mild way, they are accessing some knowledge which is allowing them to be more accurate, even if that did not reach statistical significance. So that planning time is providing extra attentional space and the speaker opts for less varied and less fluent performance and accesses that knowledge at the back of their mind they can be more accurate. 
So the task affects um, basically the p values were all about less than 0 0.001 in terms of how the task impacts on performance. That is the main thing. So task one is significantly different from performance on task two and three in terms of error-free clauses, weighted clause ratio, syntactic complexity, syntactic variety, breakdown fluency, proportion of silence. But no significant difference really between task two and three, except for this random couple of things, you know, weighted clause ratios for one and clause boundary pausing for another. I'm not talking about clause boundary pausing. It's very interesting and we've heard about it today, but I don't have time. I'll just come back and tell you about that. Um, so the pattern of results indicates that these low literacy, uh, low L1 literacy learners, regardless of whether they have time to plan or not, their oral task performance is influenced by mostly the familiarity of the information they're given to talk about and the amount of cognitive work they have to do when processing it. That's the key. They can, if they need to, formulate syntactically more complex language in response to the more complex demands of task two and three, but it's both the planners and the non-planners. Planning really wasn't involved in that. It was just the demand of the task to spin a narrative or to explain a judgment, that's what was prompting it. So my final point, it comes back to, you know, do we explain this very big difference between these studies, between the original replication in terms of low level L1 literacy? Is that, the, is that it? And I think it's possibly it, but it's very clear from um, looking at who these learners were in New Zealand that they were really very different from the ones in London in the original study in lots of different ways, including their motivation, ultimate language learning goals, and background. So the original study participants were definitely weird. They were very Western from industrial educated, rich, developed countries. But, uh, and as you look at them, they were, they were aged between 18 and 30. They were temporary visitors to the UK. They were coming to get Cambridge first certificate. Then they were going home again. They used English in their daily lives for shopping and casual conversations on buses or asking people the way to post office. They didn't have to use English in order to negotiate with the local authorities or the you know, the immigration offices or anything like that. They, they didn't need it for that, anything with high stakes. And they didn't need or have paid employment because they didn't need to earn. They did, they, they just come with their money already to do these, these first certificates in London. Whereas in New Zealand, they were older. Uh, I don't have time to talk about how difficult it was during COVID and with these populations of um, people who had been refugees to recruit them. It was difficult. We recruited them. They tend to be older. They were settled permanently in New Zealand. They were not going back to their countries of origin. Their bridges were burned. They were going to spend the rest of their lives probably in New Zealand because they'd fled from war or situations of violent conflict. They had experienced, many of them, terrible trauma they'd spent time in refugee camps. They were facing the rest of their lives, needing to integrate as far as possible into New Zealand society, earn their living right, in every way. They had to be competent in English. They had to be able to negotiate housing, health, employment, their children's education, their immigration status, their tax problems, all sorts of social obligations in English. What I haven't mentioned is what their language backgrounds were. They were so they were lots were from Afghanistan. So they had they had um, a Pashto or I wrote it down because I thought oh someone's going to ask me about that. Um, uh, Dari. There were quite a lot of people with Arabic from Iraq or from Syria. There was a couple of people uh, whose first language was Mandarin, Kurdish, 
Urdu. So anyway, English was their essential tool. So what I've called personal urgency was operating in these people that was not operating in the original study. And the personal urgency of having to build your life again with another language might dispose someone to dispense with grammatical elements that are semantically redundant and or phonologically indistinct. You know, typically, verb morphology counts as errors. Um, but it might not be because you're not able to respond to meta language that says there's a morpheme on the end of this or to be able to read it on comfortably on the page that says, you know, don't forget to put ED on the end and put highlight it in red or anything like that. It, if it's semantically redundant and phonologically indistinct, your, your idea might be, don't bother with it then. I've got more important things to do. That would not arise from the cognitive habits of a non-literate L1 background, and it wouldn't have anything to do with inability to deal with language, with meta-language but it's a sensible choice not to expend precious time and effort on something which doesn't give you any real extra communicative effectiveness. And that might account for why in the unplanned condition, there was a suggestion that the L, the, the, these participants were actually prioritizing fluency over accuracy. And in the planned condition, when they were made to wait for 10 minutes before they could get going on the task, how they were just, the, the, the uh, anecdotal evidence and the research assistants were, they just wanted to get on with it. They just wanted to talk to each other. They didn't want to fuss around thinking about what to say. So they were, they were anxious to get going. So um, I know I've probably gone beyond my time, but I'm just going to, uh, just to tell you, uh, as you're a captive audience, and I don't have anyone coming behind me, uh, after me, um, this was another major problem with the replication, which was in the original study, there were worksheets and the people in the no planning condition were basically told, turn over your worksheet, start the task. There's really no planning. But it was written down. What they had to do was written down. Because these people had literacy, issues. They weren't very good. Uh, they couldn't read the first language and they weren't that good at reading English. It was decided that rather than have them struggle with the written instructions, they should, everybody would get an oral introduction to the task, um, including what the narrative pictures were and including the details of the criminal cases. So the non-planning condition had to happen, like that, contain an element of planning, which was absent in the original study. And it may have affected what these people needed to think about because we'd given them information already. So um, I'm not sure about that, <laughs> um, but if we were going to do it again, I think we should. <laughs> I think we should definitely have them, but there should be stricter operationalization of pre-task planning. Just don't give them anything, right? Just see what, how they deal with turning over a worksheet um, and getting on with it. There needs to be a narrower age range of participants, although it's so hard to recruit people. It's easy to recruit EFL learners in London that you fall over them. This is the old days, of course, <laughs> perhaps less so now, but there were hundreds of them around. Uh, to for me to recruit from. It's much more difficult to recruit from the ex-refugee community. Um, it would be good to have a questionnaire on their motivation. What do they want out of these classes? What are they aiming to be? What kind of language user do they want to be? Do they really think that being accurate and being, um, being complex is important? Or do they just want to be fluent so that they don't waste people's time who are listening to them? Um, I would think it'd be also good to get I always think this an equivalent L1 performance to see what they're like when they're using a language that they are comfortable in. So ultimately, going back to the first question, and I will let you all go now, we do need to know if SLA theory and the implementation of task based language teaching needs to be adjusted to accommodate different types of language learning. And one of those different types of 
language learning might be affected by literacy in your L1 or not. That's my references. And I want to big, big shout out to, uh, to people in uh, the WinTech staff who did the data collection and the transcription and the coding, a lot of it. So when you applaud me, you're also applauding them. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. That was very long. I'm really sorry. No questions at all, I think, really. Oh, but if you insist, I'll talk with you, Aloy. Thank you for leading a very interesting study. And clearly, it shows the importance of replicating studies and understudies. Yes. I want to ask something about the planning, and I'm not familiar with the literature. Do you think that training in planning might explain why you're not getting uh, such an effect here? And what I'm thinking is, Planning is something that's quite inherent to schooling, right? To be in a schooling system where you, you're inherently trained to plan, to do exercises, homework, yes. etc. Presumably, your concerns are low literacy, but if they have schooling, or school will also out of the picture. No. Um, so I don't know the full details of their backgrounds, but no, generally speaking, they didn't go to school. And so this was another very interesting thing about how different they were from the literate ones in the original study um, who had all gone to school. They all knew the deal and they were all really biddable, right? You tell them to do something as a teacher in the class, they're just, they just used to it. These people were not used to it and they didn't want to do the planning. They did want to do the task, but they didn't want to do the planning. So uh, yeah, um, they didn't quite, get it if you like they didn't quite they didn't quite get it and so you're quite right if we're going to do this again there has to be i think some like you have to take them into your confidence and say we're actually really interested to know whether this will help your language be better so please play along but you're right i was thinking of this but training them to plan right or have perhaps two group one which to get no training at all and they're going to yeah. straight in relation to the usefulness of planning and perhaps that could potentially help. Very... Well, Peter and I did follow up those that study with lots of others actually back in the, the 90s. And one of the ones we did was we operationalized planning is you know because planning by yourself for 10 minutes is a bit weird and boring. But so we 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 compared that with planning as groups of learners planning on how they would do a task and then the teacher planning with the students on how to do the task before they did it. And the one with the greatest impact, beneficial impact on language was the teacher actually, um, which is, you know, I think good. You know, that, that, yes, right. Yeah, Jean-Marc. I think you, you, you raise interesting questions about the difficulty to do replication, because uh, as you pointed out, he, he, you can never quite replicate in a way that that it is it's a hundred percent match, right? You can't. As yes. You say, ju just the fact that this is a, a a really specific population makes it really hard to compare with the original results. So I, it, it would be nice if you could repeat that study with with people who have actually been schooled, um, so so that they are not totally different from from the original sample. And I I. I I would love to see yeah and, and yeah i had read i had written down no difference because because it's a kind of um wrong conception i think that we have as literate people that illiterate people are somehow less clever than we are so, so i was glad that you didn't find um the the the, the, the differences um differences between planning and non-planning or different sorry in, in fact that, that That you 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 didn't find deficits. Well, the D the D word. <laughs> I didn't say it myself, but it, I have to say, when I got first sort of approach to to do this, it appeared to me straight away as why would you even imagine that someone who's not literate in their first language can't cope with this? Why? Why would you think that? And there was a lot of, I mean, there's a, there's a very 
sort of dishonourable history of language deficit and elaborated and non-elaborated code and, and all, you know, and the whole sort of um, black English vernacular stuff, which is really troubling, you know, and it did sort of, it's in the back of my mind, why would you think that? Right. So I think this, this has, this has said there's, assumption. the basic assumption is kind of, it's, it's a little bit worrying to me, but it's one I don't think we've got to write about in this because we've come up with much stronger reasons for why these people weren't playing ball really with us i think yeah yeah i think that the quite the struggling about you that that in submissions to my yes these days it's two thirds from china so so and and this is a trend across the field so i think that that we're this is going to be extra it's it's all it's all of the weird except for w yeah, it's got the three. I mean, I, I actually, we've been told by the editors, uh, can't use the word weird now at all, because we thought we had to say non-weird and weird, because that's where we started off. But fortunately, it's now low-level L1 literacy and high-level L1 literacy. So we're just moving out of... I think that's better. I think it is better. Yes, I, I agree with you. So Pavane and then Victoria. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for all very interesting. You know, I couldn't wait to share my experience with you. This is exactly what I expected. I used to teach the same group refugees in the UK between 2001 and 2006. And I used to teach the literacy group based on my experience early on. I used to teach this um, literacy group, so I was given this job. And it's amazing that now you are researching it. Yeah. Literacy, which is the tip of the iceberg. When we go to school, we learn to develop lots of strategies, educational strategies, forget about social strategies. We develop these strategies that are crucially important in any kind of learning. And Eloy, I'm sorry, I disagree with you. I don't think training is good. When you're younger at school, developing those strategies are really easier as compared when you are post puberty. One other thing that you clearly refer to, Pauline, is we bundle them in a group of refugees, low literacy or illiterate. But as you said clearly, it's a very complex scenario. Many have got traumatic experiences. You know, I, I teach in this school and uh, very young girls from Albania who said, write a sentence about your family, she cried. Yeah. She said, yeah. my parents were in the so, uh, uh, Dyslexia. And the fact that, at least back then in this country, not in this country, but around the world, we could not test someone for dyslexia if they have not lived in this country for three years and familiarity with English for three years. So a combination of different factors contribute to this. So this is a group that really deserves being um, said. And I could see that these people stayed in the literacy group for three, four years. And these were extremely clever and intelligent people outside. What was their oracy like? Because what we haven't talked about, we haven't talked about is that this is, it, this is oral, this is an oral performance, which somehow is imagined to be dependent on a educational experience in their L1 involving them becoming literate. In a second language, very much depends, you know, I myself, if a word is difficult to pronounce, I write it in my Persian language, how it sounds. Yeah. And then I refer to it. That, that's the, that's the, the thing they bring up all the time. It's the ability of a literate per, person, illiterate in their L1, to put L2 information down on a page. <laughs> and so the, the question is if you haven't got that advantage, are you disabled as a learner? And then 
again about the context I use to teach. We think someone who is living here should have all the motivation to learn the language. This is false assumption. This is totally false assumption. And many of them back then said, because back then we needed to have a certificate of a level to get your British passport. And they were telling me that, you know, on my dead, the only reason I'm here is to get my British. Yes. British. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they were working um, you know, in restaurants here and there. They, they had their own communities. That's the, other, that's the other thing. Yeah. Said, I honestly can live here without English. Mm -hmm. So it's a very complex set of yeah. uh, factors. That's true. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. One more question, and we'll let these good people go home. Yes. Yeah. I was wondering, as you, um, as you were presenting it, um, in terms of, uh, probably because I think of it as a mark, but the role of emotion, and kind of, uh, you know, when um, it's often, if you are to repeat something, it's almost like, did, or did I do something wrong? Uh, you know, if, if, if we're going back to the school experience and kind of learning that you can repeat or do something, so kind of being schooled in that sort of idea that there's feedback and then you can do it again. Yeah. And things like that. Mm. But uh, in life, in some ways, outside of school, if you ask to do something, you know, it means that you do something wrong. So I'm just wondering if that might have increased their sort of anxiety and just being sort of, it, it sort of inhibited their performance. Rather than facilitate yeah. it. Do you see what I mean? Because I do. If you do it again, if someone says do it again, you know, oh, did I do it wrong? Or if you say I'm wrong, there's something. Wrong. Well, we weren't asking them to do it again. No, but, they didn't have it, uh, but in the classroom, they, they, I think the idea is with this whole thing that they cannot really benefit from corrective feedback because they just don't get it. You know, like a, you know, they, they just don't. Well, I hate saying it this way, but when you're telling them it's not this, it's this, you know, it's it's basically focusing on form and that they don't follow your focus on form. There's also some studies that, that show if you ask them a, a, a low literate L, L1, you know, uh, repeat after me. You know, just like just like that's research which is actually done with, with child learners. You know, they don't repeat after you. They repeat something which is close to what you said, but it's not exactly what you said. And that again, that this this might be um, a barrier to them being able to um, abstract the language from its meaning and just sort of focus on its form, and then say its form because that will help you say it better the next time round. So there, there is some research evidence that, that it's not very extensive that shows them being um, just really hopeless at that, at that task. It's not very extensive, but it's supposed to be, you know, it's all part of sort of being explicitly focused on language as a task rather than the content of the task as a task, I think, which is very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. And uh, I have the uh, honor to um, uh, to close. Now, I took too long in my presentation. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, but it's very important to thank people. Oh, hello, world. So, uh, so we're closing now. And um, so there's lots of people to thank. So I want to thank Birkbeck for letting us have the room. This is a lovely room. And thank you, Jean, for um, arranging it for us. It was fantastic. Uh, big thanks to Kasia and Victoria for organizing this complex array. I mean, honestly, there's, there's cables and there's screens all over the place here. It's awesome. 
Uh, but it's been really great to have the online presence, and I think we will do it again if we, you know, we, we should. We've shown it can be done. I want to thank all the presenters because, it, the, the, I mean, the quality of the papers, you know, I leave myself out, of course, uh, is remarkable in variety and the depth <laughs> and the quality. Well done. It was absolutely fascinating, all of you. Um, and thank you to the audience, those of you who are here. And if anyone is online, thank you for joining in with your questions, uh, with your attention and, um, and helping us make this to be such a great occasion. And I hope to see you at the next colloquium, which we will do next year. So big round of applause to all of you.